Introduction to Sea Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Sea Stories. Edited by Cyrus Townsend Brady. Yarns of the Forecastle. By Cyrus Townsend Brady. Most of us have passed through a period of life during which we have ardently longed to be, if not actually a rover, a buccaneer, or a pirate, at least, and really, a sailor. To run away to sea has been the misdirected ambition of many a youngster, and some lads there are who have realized their desire to their sorrow. The boy who has not cherished in his heart and exhibited in his actions at some time or other during his youthful days a love of ships and salt water is fit for well he is fit for the shore and that is the worst thing a sailor could say about him the virile nations the strong peoples are those whose countries border on the sea they who go down to the great deep in ships are they who master the world on the ocean as well as on the mountain top dwells the spirit of freedom when men have struggled with each other in the shock of war or the emulation of peace when they have matched skill against skill strength to strength courage with courage the higher quality of manhood in each instance has been required upon the sea for there the sharp contention has been not only between man and man but between nature and man as well a double portion of heroic spirit is needed to meet the double demand that is the reason we love the sea it is this homeric spirit of the ocean masters that fills the dreams of youth and stirs the memories of old age in these dreams and memories the various boy catches glimpses of the perpetual titanic struggle of and on the deep dimly discerning in his youthful way a thousand generations of heroic achievement before and through which he begins to be and he realizes that the ocean affords such a field for the exhibition of every high quality that goes to make a man as may be found nowhere else the deck of the ship is the arena upon which he can play a mighty part and he loves it in imagination the boy now discovers a new world like Columbus and America in dreams he opens a vast empire to civilization like Perry in Japan sometimes he fights the battles of the free like Nelson at Trafalgar or he strikes for his own flag on the decks of some gallant constitution if he be a sportsman he may pursue the great fighting sperm whale or angle for Jack Sharkey if an adventurer he may seek to pierce the icy barrier of mystery ringed about that polar star by which he guides his ship if a trader he may visit strange lands and seek new markets for his product if a missionary he may carry his gospel of good tidings to dark peoples ignorant of the meaning of that southern cross which flashes in splendor above them in the midnight heavens and tell to them the story of the ruler of the deep wherever men achieve and do wherever nations grow and prosper they have a mastery of the sea in these pages are gathered stories of the heroes of peace not less kings of the sea than those who have startled the mighty depths with the thunder of their warship guns the freshness the freedom of it the joy and delight the calm and rest the strenuous life the labor and sorrow the peril and danger the reward and success all are here we turn back some hundred years to go a cruising with cleveland we hunt the cachalot with bullen our own cooper takes us breathless with the romantic pilot over the dangers of the devil's grip under the antarctic circle we watch the sea lions play here a mighty monster of the hideous depths seems to spread its tentacles across the printed page in a struggle which victor hugo immortalizes flame and smoke 
are those deadliest of perils to ships toward which gentle jean ingelow conducts us the sudden mutiny the long cruise in the small boat the lonely islet affording the shipwrecked a haven appeal to us in these pages we drift through the teeming waters of the gulf stream daniel defoe and melville and marriott and couples and russell and kingston unroll before us the panorama of the ocean there are also men great in other fields of letters who have felt the witchery of the sea and tell us what it says to them charles dickens pierre loti stevenson charles reed and kingsley we envy the boy or girl who reads these tales for the first time fain would we again enjoy such a happy privilege and our envy deepens when we think of the wide range of literature to which this volume will introduce them lucky young people who open such pages for a first glance cyrus townsend brady philadelphia pennsylvania december twentieth nineteen o one end of introduction Story One, Part One of Sea Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sea Stories, edited by Cyrus Townsend Brady. Story One, Part One. Narrative of the Mutiny of the Bounty, from Chambers Miscellany about the year 1786 the merchants and planters interested in the west india islands became anxious to introduce an exceedingly valuable plant the breadfruit tree into these possessions and as this could best be done by a government expedition a request was preferred to the crown accordingly the ministry at the time being favorable to the proposed undertaking a vessel named the bounty was selected to execute the desired object to the command of this ship, Captain W. Bly was appointed August 16, 1787. The burden of the bounty was nearly 215 tons. The establishment of men and officers for the ship was as follows. One lieutenant to command, one master, one boatswain, one gunner, one carpenter, one surgeon, two master's mates, two midshipmen, two quartermasters, one quartermaster's mate, one boatswain's mate, one gunner's mate, one carpenter's mate, one carpenter's crew, one sailmaker, one armorer, one corporal, one clerk and steward, twenty-three able seamen, total forty-four. The addition of two men appointed to take care of the plants made the whole ship's crew amount to forty-six. The ship was stored and victualled for eighteen months. Thus prepared, the bounty set sail on the 23rd of December, and what ensued will be best told in the language of Captain Bly. Monday, 27th of April, 1789. The wind being northerly in the evening, we steered to the westward to pass to the south of Tofua. I gave directions for this course to be continued during the night. The master had the first watch, the gunner the middle watch, and Mr. Christian the morning watch. Tuesday, the 28th, just before sunrising, while I was yet asleep, Mr. Christian, with a master at arms, gunner's mate, and Thomas Burkett, a seaman, came into my cabin, and seizing me, tied my hands with a cord behind my back, threatening me with instant death if I spoke or made the least noise. I, however, called as loud as I could in hopes of assistance but they had already secured the officers who were not of their party by placing sentinels at their doors there were three men at my cabin door besides the four within christian had only a cutlass in his hand the others had muskets and bayonets i was pulled out of bed and forced on deck in my shirt suffering great pain from the tightness with which they had tied my hands i demanded the reason of such violence but received no other answer than abuse for not holding my tongue. The master, the gunner, the surgeon, Mr. Elphinstone, master's mate, and Nelson were kept confined below, and the fore hatchway was guarded by sentinels. The boatswain, 
and Carpenter, and also the clerk, Mr. Samuel, were allowed to come upon deck. The boatswain was ordered to hoist the launch out with a threat, if he did not do it instantly, to take care of himself. When the boat was out, Mr. Hayward and Mr. Hallett, two of the midshipmen and Mr. Samuel, were ordered into it. I demanded what their intention was in giving this order, and endeavored to persuade the people near me not to persist in such acts of violence, but it was to no effect. Christian changed the cutlass, which he had in his hand for a bayonet that was brought to him, and holding me with a strong grip by the cord that tied my hands, he, with many oaths, threatened to kill me immediately if I would not be quiet. The villains round me had their pieces cocked and bayonets fixed. Particular people were called on to go into the boat, and were hurried over the side, whence I concluded that with these people I was to be set adrift. I therefore made another effort to bring about a change, but with no other effect than to be threatened with having my brains blown out. The boatswain and seamen who were to go in the boat were allowed to collect twine, canvas, lines, sails, cordage, an eight-and-twenty-gallon cask of water, and Mr. Samuel got a hundred and fifty pounds of bread with a small quantity of rum and wine, also a quadrant and compass. But he was forbidden on pain of death to touch either map, ephemeris book of astronomical observations, sextant, timekeeper, or any of my surveys or drawings. The officers were next called upon deck, and forced over the side into the boat, while I was kept apart from every one abaft the mizzenmast. Isaac Martin, one of the guard over me, I saw had an inclination to assist me, and as he fed me with shaddock, my lips being quite parched, we explained our wishes to each other by our looks. But this being observed, Martin was removed from me. He then attempted to leave the ship, for which purpose he got into the boat. But with many threats, they obliged him to return. The armorer, Joseph Coleman, and two of the carpenters, McIntosh and Norman, were also kept contrary to their inclination, and they begged of me, after I was astern in the boat, to remember that they declared that they had no hand in the transaction. Michael Byrne, I am told, likewise, wanted to leave the ship. It appeared to me that Christian was some time in doubt whether he should keep the carpenter or his mates. At length he determined on the latter, and the carpenter was ordered into the boat. He was permitted, but not without some opposition, to take his tool chest. The officers and men being in the boat, they only waited for me of which the master-at-arms informed Christian, who then said, Come, Captain Bly, your officers and men are now in the boat, and you must go with them. If you attempt to make the least resistance, you will instantly be put to death. And without further ceremony, with a tribe of armed ruffians about me, I was forced over the side, where they untied my hands. Being in the boat, we were veered astern by a rope. A few pieces of pork were thrown to us, and some clothes also four cutlasses, and it was then that the armorer and carpenters called out to me to remember that they had no hand in the transaction. After having undergone a great deal of ridicule, and having been kept some time to make sport for these unfeeling wretches, we were at length cast adrift in the open ocean. I had eighteen persons with me in the boat. There remained on board the bounty twenty-five hands, the most able men of the ship's company, Having little or no wind, we rode pretty fast towards Tofoa, which bore northeast about ten leagues from us. While the ship was in sight, she steered to the west-northwest. But I considered this only as a feint, for when we were sent away, huzzah for Otaheite was frequently heard among the mutineers. It will very naturally be asked, what could be the reason for such a revolt? In answer to which I can only conjecture that the mutineers had flattered themselves with the hopes of a more happy life among the Otahitians than they could possibly enjoy in England. And this, joined to some female connections, most probably occasioned the whole transaction. The women at Otahiti are handsome, mild and cheerful in their manners and conversation, possessed of great sensibility, and have sufficient delicacy to make them admired and beloved. The chiefs were so much attached to our people that they rather encouraged their stay among them than otherwise, and even made them promises of large possessions. 
Under these and many other attendant circumstances equally desirable, it is now perhaps not so much to be wondered at, though scarcely possible to have been foreseen, that a set of sailors, most of them void of connections, should be led away, especially when in addition to such powerful inducements, they imagined it in their power to fix themselves in the midst of plenty, on one of the finest islands in the world, where they need not labor, and where the allurements of dissipation are beyond anything that can be conceived. Fate of the Castaways My first determination was to seek a supply of breadfruit and water at Tofoa, and afterwards to sail for Tongataboo, and there risk a solicitation to Pulaho the king to equip our boat, and grant us a supply of water and provisions, so as to enable us to reach the East Indies. The quantity of provisions I found in the boat was a hundred and fifty pounds of bread, sixteen pieces of pork, each piece weighing two pounds, six quarts of rum, six bottles of wine, with twenty-eight gallons of water, and four empty barracos. We got to Tofoa when it was dark, but found the shore so steep and rocky that we could not land. We were obliged, therefore, to remain all night in the boat, keeping it on the lee side of the island with two oars. Next day, Wednesday, April 29th, we found a cove where we landed. I observed the latitude of this cove to be 19 degrees 41 minutes south. This is the northwest part of Tofoa, the northwesternmost of the friendly islands. As I was resolved to spare the small stock of provisions we had in the boat, we endeavored to procure something towards our support on the island itself. For two days we ranged through the island in parties, seeking for water and anything in the shape of provisions, subsisting meanwhile on morsels of what we had brought with us. The island at first seemed uninhabited, but on Friday, May 1st, one of our exploring parties met Cove and brought two coconut shells of water. I endeavored to make friends of these people and send them away for breadfruit, plantains, and water. Soon after, other natives came to us, and by noon there were thirty about us, from whom we obtained a small supply. I was much puzzled in what manner to account to the natives for the loss of my ship. I knew they had too much sense to be amused with a story that the ship was to join me when she was not in sight from the hills. I was at first doubtful whether I should tell the real fact, or say that the ship had overset and sunk, and that we only were saved. The latter appeared to be the most proper and advantageous for us, and I accordingly instructed my people that we might all agree in one story. As I expected, inquiries were made about the ship, and they seemed readily satisfied with our account. But there did not appear the least symptom of joy or sorrow in their faces, although I fancied I discovered some marks of surprise. Some of the natives were coming and going the whole afternoon. Towards evening, I had the satisfaction to find our stock of provisions somewhat increased, but the natives did not appear to have much to spare. What they brought was in such small quantities that I had no reason to hope we should be able to procure from them sufficient to stock us for our voyage. At night I served a quarter of a breadfruit and a cocoa nut to each person for supper, and a good fire being made, all but the watch went to sleep. Saturday the second. As there was no certainty of our being supplied with water by the natives, I sent a party among the gullies in the mountains with empty shells to see what could be found. In their absence the natives came about us, as I expected, and in greater numbers. Two canoes also came in from round the north side of the island. In one of them was an elderly chief called maka Soon after, some of our foraging party returned, and with them came a good-looking chief called Igijifo or Ifo. Their affability was of short duration, for the natives began to increase in number, and I observed some symptoms of a design against us. Soon after, they attempted to haul the boat on shore, on which I brandished my cutlass in a threatening manner, and spoke to Ifo to desire them to desist, which they did, and everything became quiet again. My people, who had been in the mountains, now returned with about three gallons of water, and I kept buying up the little breadfruit that was brought to us, and likewise some spears to arm my men with, having only four cutlasses, two of which were in the boat. 
as we had no means of improving our situation i told our people i would wait until sunset by which time perhaps something might happen in our favor for if we attempted to go at present we might fight our way through which we could do more advantageously at night and that in the meantime we would endeavor to get off to the boat what we had bought the beach was lined with the natives and we heard nothing but the knocking of stones together which they had in each hand i knew very well this was the sign of an attack at noon i served a coconut and a breadfruit to each person for dinner and gave some to the chiefs with whom i continued to appear intimate and friendly they frequently importuned me to sit down but i as constantly refused for it occurred both to nelson and myself that they intended to seize hold of me if i gave them such an opportunity keeping therefore constantly in our guard we were suffered to eat our uncomfortable meal in some quietness after dinner we began by little and little to get our things into the boat which was a troublesome business on account of the surf i carefully watched the motions of the natives who continued to increase in number and found that instead of their intention being to leave us fires were made and places fixed on for their stay during the night consultations were also held among them and everything assured me we should be attacked i sent orders to the master that when he saw us coming down he should keep the boat close to the shore that we might the more readily embark the sun was near setting when i gave the word on which every person who was on shore with me boldly took up his proportion of things and carried them to the boat the chiefs asked me if i would not stay with them all night i said no i never sleep out of my boat but in the morning we will again trade with you and i shall remain till the weather is moderate that we may go as we have agreed to see pulaho at tongataboo maka akavau then got up and said you will not sleep on shore then matey which directly signifies we will kill you and he left me the onset was now preparing everyone as i have described before kept knocking stones together and efo quitted me all but two or three things were in the boat when we walked down the beach every one in a silent kind of horror we all got into the boat except one man who while i was getting on board quitted it and ran up to the beach to cast the stern fast off notwithstanding the master and others called him to return while they were hauling me out of the water i was no sooner in the boat than the attack began by about two hundred men the unfortunate poor man who had run up the beach was knocked down and the stones flew like a shower of shot many indians got hold of the stern rope and were near hauling the boat on shore which they would certainly have effected if i had not had a knife in my pocket with which i cut the rope we then hauled off to the grapnel everyone being more or less hurt at this time i saw five of the natives about the poor man they had killed and two of them were beating him about the head with stones in their hands we had no time to reflect for to my surprise they filled their canoes with stones and twelve men came after us to renew the attack which they did so effectually as to nearly disable us all we were obliged to sustain the attack without being able to return it except with such stones as lodged in the boat i adopted the expedient of throwing overboard some clothes which as i expected they stopped to pick up and as it was by this time almost dark they gave over the attack and returned towards shore leaving us to reflect on our unhappy situation the poor man killed by the natives was john norton this was his second voyage with me as a quartermaster and his worthy character made me lament his loss very much he has left an aged parent i am told whom he supported we set our sails and steered along shore by the west side of the island of tofoa the wind blowing fresh from the eastward my mind was employed in considering what was best to be done when i was solicited by all hands to take them towards home and when i told them that no hopes of relief for us remained except what might be found at new holland till i came to timor a distance of full twelve hundred leagues where there was a dutch settlement but in what part of the island i knew not they all agreed to live on one ounce of bread and a quarter of a pint of water per day therefore after examining our stock of provisions and recommending to them in the most solemn manner not to depart from their promise we bore away across a sea where the navigation is but little known in a small boat 
twenty-three feet long from stem to stern deep laden with eighteen men I was happy however to see that everyone seemed better satisfied with our situation than myself our stock of provisions consisted of about 150 pounds of bread, 28 gallons of water, 20 pounds of pork, 3 bottles of wine, and 5 quarts of rum. The difference between this and the quantity we had on leaving the ship was principally owing to our loss in the bustle and confusion of the attack. A few coconuts were in the boat, and some breadfruit, but the latter was trampled to pieces. Sunday the 3rd at daybreak the gale increased the sun rose very fiery and red a sure indication of a severe gale of wind at eight it blew a violent storm and the sea ran very high so that between the seas the sail was becalmed and when on the top of the sea it was too much to have set but we could not venture to take in the sail for we were in very imminent danger and distress the sea curling over the stern of the boat which obliged us to bail with all our might a situation more distressing has perhaps seldom been experienced our bread was in bags and in danger of being spoiled by the wet to be starved to death was inevitable if this could not be prevented i therefore began to examine what clothes there were in the boat and what other things could be spared and having determined that only two suits should be kept for each person the rest was thrown overboard with some rope and spare sails which lightened the boat considerably and we had more room to bail the water out fortunately the carpenter had good chest in the boat in which we secured the bread the most favorable moment his tool chest also was cleared and the tools stowed in the bottom of the boat so that this became a second convenience i served a teaspoon of rum to each person for we were very wet and cold with a quarter of a breadfruit which was scarce eatable for dinner our engagement was now strictly to be carried into execution and i was fully determined to make our provisions last eight weeks let the daily proportion be ever so small monday the fourth at daylight our limbs were so benumbed that we could scarcely find the use of them at this time i served a teaspoon of rum to each person from which we all found great benefit just before noon we discovered a small flat island of a moderate height bearing west southwest four or five leagues i observed our latitude to be eighteen degrees fifty eight minutes south our longitude was by account three degrees four minutes west from the island of tofoa having made a north seventy two degrees west course distance of ninety five miles since yesterday noon i divided five small coconuts for our dinner and everyone was satisfied during the rest of that day we discovered ten or twelve other islands none of which we approached at night i served a few broken pieces of breadfruit for supper and performed prayers tuesday the fifth the night having been fair we awoke after a tolerable rest and contentedly breakfasted on a few pieces of yams that were found in the boat after breakfast we examined our bread a great deal of which was damaged and rotten this nevertheless we were glad to keep for use we passed two islands in the course of the day for dinner i served some of the damaged bread and a quarter of a pint of water wednesday the sixth we still kept our course in the direction of the north of new holland passing numerous islands of various sizes at none of which i ventured to land our allowance for the day was a quarter of a pint of coconut milk and the meat which did not exceed two ounces to each person it was received very contentedly but we suffered great drought to our great joy we hooked a fish but we were miserably disappointed by its being lost in trying to get it into the boat as our lodgings were very miserable and confined for want of room i endeavored to remedy the latter defect by putting ourselves at watch and watch so that one half always sat up while the other lay down on the boat's bottom or upon a chest with nothing to cover us but the heavens our limbs were dreadfully cramped for we could not stretch them out and the nights were so cold and we so constantly wet that after a few hours sleep we could scarcely move thursday the seventh being very wet and cold i served a spoonful of rum and a morsel of bread for breakfast we still kept sailing among the islands from one of which two large canoes put out in chase of us but we left them behind whether these canoes had any hostile intention against us must remain a doubt 
Perhaps we might have benefited by an intercourse with them, but in our defenseless situation to have made the experiment would have been risking too much. I imagine these to be the islands called Fiji, as their extent, direction, and distance from the friendly islands answer to the description given of them by those islanders. Heavy rain came on at four o'clock, when every person did their utmost to catch some water, and we increased our stock to thirty-four gallons, besides quenching our thirst for the first time since we had been at sea. But an attendant consequence made us pass the night very miserably. For, being extremely wet and having no dry things to shift or cover us, we experienced cold shiverings scarcely to be conceived. Most fortunately for us, the forenoon, Friday the 8th, turned out fair, and we stripped and dried our clothes. The allowance I issued today was an ounce and a half of pork, a teaspoon of rum, half a pint of coconut milk, and an ounce of bread. The rum, though so small in quantity, was of the greatest service. A fishing line was generally towing from the stern of the boat, but though we saw great numbers of fish, we could never catch one. In the afternoon we cleaned out the boat, and it employed us till sunset to get everything dry and in order. Hitherto I had issued the allowance by guess, but I now made a pair of scales with two coconut shells, and having accidentally some pistol balls in the boat, twenty-five of which weighed one pound or sixteen ounces, I adopted one as the proportion of weight that each person should receive of bread at the times I served it. I also amused all hands with describing the situation of New Guinea and New Holland, and gave them every information in my power that in case any accident happened to me, those who survived might have some idea of what they were about, and be able to find their way to Timor, which at present they knew nothing of more than the name, and some not even that. At night I served a quarter of a pint of water and half an ounce of bread for supper. Saturday the ninth. About nine in the evening the clouds began to gather, and we had a prodigious fall of rain with severe thunder and lightning. By midnight we caught about twenty gallons of water. Being miserably wet and cold, I served to the people a teaspoon of rum each to enable them to bear with their distressed situation. The weather continued extremely bad, and the wind increased. We spent a very miserable night without sleep, except such as could be got in the midst of rain. The day brought no relief but its light. The sea broke over us so much that two men were constantly bailing, and we had no choice how to steer, being obliged to keep before the waves for fear of the boat filling. The allowance now regularly served to each person was one twenty-fifth of a pound of bread and a quarter of a pint of water at eight in the morning, at noon, and at sunset. Today I gave about half an ounce of pork for dinner, which, though any moderate person would have considered only as a mouthful, was divided into three or four. All Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, the wet weather continued with heavy seas and squalls. As there was no prospect of getting our clothes dried, my plan was to make every one strip and wring them through the salt water, by which means they received a warmth that while wet with rain they could not have. We were constantly shipping seas and bailing, and were very wet and cold during the night. The sight of the islands, which we were always passing, served only to increase the misery of our situation. We were very little better than starving, with plenty in view, and yet to attempt procuring any relief was attended with so much danger that prolonging of life, even in the midst of misery, was thought preferable, while there remained hopes of being able to surmount our hardships. For my own part, I consider the general run of cloudy and wet weather to be a blessing of providence. Hot weather would have caused us to have died with thirst, and probably, being so constantly covered with rain or sea, protected us from that dreadful calamity. Saturday the 16th the sun breaking out through the clouds gave us hopes of drying our wet clothes but the sunshine was of short duration we had strong breezes at southeast by south and dark gloomy weather with storms of thunder lightning and rain the night was truly horrible and not a star to be seen so that our steerage was uncertain sunday the seventeenth at dawn of day i found every person complaining and some of them solicited extra allowance, which I positively refused. 
Our situation was miserable, always wet, and suffering extreme cold during the night, without the least shelter from the weather. Being constantly obliged to bail to keep the boat from filling was perhaps not to be reckoned an evil, as it gave us exercise. The little rum we had was of great service. When our nights were particularly distressing, I generally served a teaspoonful or two to each person, and it was always joyful tidings when they heard of my intentions. The night was dark and dismal, the sea constantly breaking over us, and nothing but the wind and waves to direct our steerage. It was my intention, if possible, to make to New Holland, to the southward of Endeavour Straits, being sensible that it was necessary to preserve such a situation as would make a southerly wind a fair one, that we might range along the reefs till an opening should be found into smooth water, and we the sooner be able to pick up some refreshments. Monday and Tuesday were terrible days, heavy rain with lightning. We were always bailing. On Wednesday the 20th, at dawn of day, some of my people seemed half dead. Our appearance was horrible, and I could look no way but I caught the eye of someone in distress. Extreme hunger was now too evident, but no one suffered from thirst, nor had we much inclination to drink, that desire perhaps being satisfied through the skin. The little sleep we got was in the midst of water, and we constantly awoke with severe cramps and pains in our bones. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we were in the same distressed condition, and I began to fear that such another night or two would put an end to us. On Saturday, however, the wind moderated in the evening, and the weather looked so much better, which rejoiced all hands, so that they ate their scanty allowance with more satisfaction than for some time past. The night also was fair, but being always wet with the sea, we suffered much from the cold. End of Story One, Part One. Story One, Part Two of Sea Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sea Stories, edited by Cyrus Townsend Brady. Story One, Part Two. Narrative of the Mutiny of the Bounty, from Chambers Miscellany. Sunday, the 24th, a fine morning. I had the pleasure to see produce some cheerful countenances, and for the first time, for fifteen days past, we experienced comfort from the warmth of the sun. We stripped and hung our clothes up to dry, which were by this time become so threadbare that they would not keep out either wet or cold. This afternoon we had many birds about us, which are never seen far from land, such as boobies and noddies. As the sea began to run fair, and we shipped but little water, I took the opportunity to examine into the state of our bread, and found that according to the present mode of issuing, there was a sufficient quantity remaining for twenty-nine days' allowance, by which time I hoped we should be able to reach Timor. But as this was very uncertain, and it was possible that, after all, we might be obliged to go to Java, I determined to proportion the allowance so as to make our stock hold out six weeks. I was apprehensive that this would be ill-received, and that it would require my utmost resolution to enforce it, for small as the quantity was which I intended to take away for our future good, yet it might appear to my people like robbing them of life, and some who were less patient than their companions, I expected, would very ill brook it. However, on my representing the necessity of guarding against delays that might be occasioned in our voyage by contrary winds or other causes, and promising to enlarge upon the allowance as we got on, they cheerfully agreed to my proposal. It was accordingly settled that every person should receive one twenty-fifth of a pound of bread for breakfast, and the same quantity for dinner, so that by omitting the proportion for supper we had forty-three days' allowance. Monday, the 25th. At noon some noddies came so near to us that one of them was caught by hand. This bird was about the size of a small pigeon. I divided it with its entrails into eighteen portions, and by a well-known method at sea of 
who shall have this it was distributed with the allowance of bread and water for dinner and ate up bones and all with salt water for sauce I observed the latitude 13 degrees 32 minutes south longitude made 35 degrees 19 minutes west course north 89 degrees west distance 108 miles in the evening several boobies flying very near to us we had the good fortune to catch one of them this bird is as large as a duck I directed the bird to be killed for supper and the blood to be given to three of the people who were most distressed for want of food the body with the entrails beak and feet I divided into 18 shares and with an allowance of bread which I made a merit of granting we made a good supper compared with our usual fare sailing on Tuesday Wednesday and Thursday I at length became satisfied that we were approaching New Holland this was actually the case and after passing the reefs which bound that part of the coast we found ourselves in smooth water two islands lay about four miles to the west by north and appeared eligible for a resting place if for nothing more but on our approach to the nearest island it proved to be only a heap of stones and its size too inconsiderable to shelter the boat we therefore proceeded to the next which was close to it and toward the main we landed to examine if there were any signs of the natives being near us we saw some old fireplaces but nothing to make me apprehend that this would be an unsafe situation for the night everyone was anxious to find something to eat and it was soon discovered that there were oysters on these rocks for the tide was out but it was nearly dark and only a few could be gathered I determined therefore to wait till the morning when I should know better how to proceed Friday the 29th as there were no appearances to make me imagine that any of the natives were near us I sent out parties in search of supplies while others of the people were putting the boat in order The parties returned highly rejoiced at having found plenty of oysters and fresh water I had also made a fire by the help of a small magnifying glass and what was still more fortunate We found among a few things which had been thrown into the boat and saved a piece of brimstone and a tinder box so that I secured fire for the future one of the people had been so provident as to bring away with him from the ship a copper pot by being in possession of this article we were enabled to make a proper use of the supply we now obtained for with a mixture of bread and a little pork we made a stew that might have been relished by people of far more delicate appetites and of which each person received a full pint the general complaints of disease among us were a dizziness in the head great weakness of the joints and violent tenesmus the oysters which we found grew so fast to the rocks that it was with difficulty they could be broken off and at length we discovered to be the most expeditious way to open them where they were fixed they were of a good size and well tasted to add to this happy circumstance in the hollow of the land there grew some wire grass which indicated a moist situation on forcing a stick about three feet long into the ground we found water and with little trouble dug a well which produced as much as our necessities required as the day was the anniversary of the restoration of King Charles the second I named the island restoration Island our short stay there with the supplies which it afforded us made a visible alteration for the better in our appearance next day saturday the thirtieth at four o'clock we were preparing to embark when about twenty of the natives appeared running and hallooing to us on the opposite shore they were each armed with a spear or lance and a short weapon which they carried in their left hand they made signs for us to come to them but i thought it prudent to make the best of our way they were naked and apparently black and their hair all wool bushy and short sunday the thirty first Many small islands were in sight to the northeast. We landed at one of good height, bearing north one half west. The shore was rocky, but the water was smooth, and we landed without difficulty. I sent two parties out, one to the northward and the other to the southward, to seek for supplies, and others I ordered to stay by the boat. On this occasion, fatigue and weakness so far got the better of their sense of duty. 
that some of the people expressed their discontent at having worked harder than their companions, and declared that they would rather be without their dinner than go in search of it. One person in particular went so far as to tell me with a mutinous look that he was as good a man as myself. It was not possible for me to judge where this might have an end if not stopped in time. Therefore, to prevent such disputes in the future, I determined either to preserve my command or die in the attempt, and seizing a cutlass, I ordered him to take hold of another and defend himself, on which he called out that I was going to kill him, and immediately made concessions. I did not allow this to interfere further with the harmony of the boat's crew, and everything soon became quiet. We here procured some oysters and clams, also some dogfish caught in the holes of the rocks, and a supply of water. Leaving this island, which I named Sunday Island, we continued our course towards Endeavour Straits. During our voyage, Nelson became very ill, but gradually recovered. Next day we landed at another island to see what we could get. There were proofs that this island was occasionally visited by natives from New Holland. And camping on the shore, I sent out one party to watch for turtle, and another to try to catch birds. About midnight the bird party returned with only twelve noddies, birds which I have already described to be about the size of pigeons, but if it had not been for the folly and obstinacy of one of the party, who separated from the other two and disturbed the birds, they might have caught a great number. I was so much provoked at my plans being thus defeated that I gave this offender a good beating. This man afterwards confessed that, wandering away from his companions, he had eaten nine birds raw. Our turtling party had no success. Tuesday and Wednesday we still kept our course northwest, touching at an island or two for oysters and clams. We had now been six days on the coast of New Holland and but for the refreshment which our visit to its shores afforded us, it is all but certain that we must have perished. Now, however, it became clear that we were leaving it behind, and were commencing our adventurous journey through the open sea to Timor. On Wednesday, June 3rd, at 8 o'clock in the evening, we once more launched into the open ocean. Miserable as our situation was in every respect, I was secretly surprised to see that it did not appear to affect anyone so strongly as myself. I encouraged everyone with hopes that eight or ten days would bring us to a land of safety, and after praying to God for a continuance of His most gracious protection, I served an allowance of water for supper, and directed our course to the west-southwest to counteract the southerly winds in case they should blow strong. For six days our voyage continued. A dreary repetition of those sufferings which we had experienced before reaching New Holland. In the course of the night, we were constantly wet with the sea and exposed to cold and shiverings, and in the daytime, we had no addition to our scanty allowance save a booby and a small dolphin that we caught, the former on Friday the 5th and the latter on Monday the 8th. Many of us were ill, and the men complained heavily. On Wednesday the 10th, after a very comfortless night, there was a visible alteration for the worse in many of the people, which gave me great apprehensions. An extreme weakness, swelled legs, hollow and ghastly countenances, a more than common inclination to sleep, with an apparent debility of understanding, seemed to me the melancholy presages of an approaching dissolution. Thursday the 11th. Everyone received the customary allowance of bread and water, and an extra allowance of water was given to those who were most in need. At noon I observed in latitude 9 degrees 41 minutes south, course south 77 degrees west, distance 109 miles, longitude made 13 degrees 49 minutes west. I had little doubt now of having now passed the meridian of the eastern part of Timor, which is laid down at 128 degrees east. This diffused universal joy and satisfaction. Friday the 12th. At three in the morning, with an excess of joy, we discovered Timor bearing from west-southwest to west-northwest, and I hauled on a wind to the north-northeast till daylight. When the land bore from southwest by south to northeast by north, our distance from the shore two leagues, 
It is not possible for me to describe the pleasure which the blessing of the sight of this land diffused among us. It appeared scarcely credible to ourselves that in an open boat, and so poorly provided, we should have been able to reach the coast of Timor in forty-one days after leaving Tofoa, having in that time run by our log a distance of three thousand six hundred and eighteen miles, and that notwithstanding our extreme distress, no one should have perished in the voyage. I have already mentioned that I knew not where the Dutch settlement was situated, but I had a faint idea that it was at the southwest part of the island. I therefore, after daylight, bore away along shore to the south-southwest, which I was the more readily induced to do, as the wind would not suffer us to go towards the northeast without great loss of time. We coasted along the island in the direction in which I conceived the Dutch settlement to lie, and next day, about two o'clock, I came to a grapnel in a small sandy bay where we saw a hut, a dog, and some cattle. Here I learned that the Dutch governor resided at a place called Kupang, which was some distance to the northeast. I made signs for one of the Indians who came to the beach to go in the boat and show us the way to Kupang intimating that I would pay him for his trouble. The man readily complied and came into the boat. The Indians, who were of a dark, tawny color, brought us a few pieces of dried turtle and some ears of Indian corn. This last was the most welcome, for the turtle was so hard that it could not be eaten without being first soaked in hot water. They offered to bring us some other refreshments if I would wait, but as the pilot was willing, I determined to push on. It was about half-past four when we sailed. Sunday the 14th. At one o'clock in the morning, after the most happy and sweet sleep that ever men enjoyed, we weighed and continued to keep the east shore on board in very smooth water. The report of two cannon that were fired gave new life to everyone, and soon after we discovered two square-rigged vessels and a cutter at anchor to the eastward. After hard rowing, we came to a grapnel near daylight, off a small fort and town, which the pilot told me was Kupang. On landing, I was surrounded by many people, Indians and Dutch, with an English sailor among them. A Dutch captain named Spikerman showed me great kindness, and waited on the governor, who was ill, to know at what time I could see him. Eleven o'clock having been appointed for the interview, I desired my people to come on shore, which was as much as some of them could do, being scarce able to walk. They, however, were helped to Captain Spikerman's house, and found tea with bread and butter provided for their breakfast. The abilities of a painter perhaps could seldom have been displayed to more advantage than in the delineation of the two groups of figures which at this time presented themselves to each other. An indifferent spectator would have been at a loss which most to admire, the eyes of famine sparkling at immediate relief, or the horror of their preservers at the sight of so many spectres, whose ghastly countenances, if the cause had been unknown, would rather have excited terror than pity. Our bodies were nothing but skin and bone, our limbs were full of sores, and we were clothed in rags. In this condition, with tears of joy and gratitude flowing down our cheeks, the people of Timor beheld us with a mixture of horror, surprise, and pity. The governor, Mr. William Adrian Van Est, notwithstanding extreme ill health, became so anxious about us that I saw him before the appointed time. He received me with great affection, and gave me the fullest proofs that he was possessed of every feeling of a humane and good man. Though his infirmity was so great that he could not do the office of a friend himself, he said he would give such orders as I might be certain would procure us every supply we wanted. A house should be immediately prepared for me, and with respect to my people, he said that I might have room for them either at the hospital or on board of Captain Spikerman's ship, which lay in the road. Fate of the Mutineers, Colony of Pitcairn's Island The intelligence of the mutiny and the sufferings of Bly and his companions naturally excited a great sensation in England. Bly was immediately promoted to the rank of commander, and Captain Edwards was dispatched to Otaheite in the Pandora frigate with instructions to search for the bounty and her mutinous crew and bring them to England. 
The Pandora reached Matavai Bay on the 23rd of March 1791 and even before she had come to anchor Joseph Coleman Formerly armor of the bounty pushed off from shore in a canoe and came on board in the course of two days afterwards the whole of the remainder of the bounty's crew in number 16 then on the island surrendered themselves with the exception of two who fled to the mountains where as afterwards appeared they were murdered by the natives nearly 20 years elapsed after the period of the above occurrences and all recollection of the bounty and her wrecked crew had passed away when an accidental discovery as interesting as unexpected once more recalled public attention to that event the captain of an american schooner having in 1808 accidentally touched at an island up to that time supposed to be uninhabited called pitcairn's island found a community speaking english who represented themselves as the descendants of the mutineers of the bounty of whom there was still one man of the name of alexander smith alive amongst them intelligence of this singular circumstance was sent by the american captain folger to sir sidney smith at valparaiso and by him transmitted to the lords of the admiralty but the government was at that time perhaps too much engaged in the events of the continental war to attend to the information nor was anything further heard of this interesting little society until 1814 in that year two British men of war cruising in the Pacific made Pitcairn's Island and on nearing the shore saw plantations regularly and orderly laid out soon afterwards they observed a few natives coming down a steep descent with their canoes on their shoulders and in a few minutes perceived one of these little vessels darting through a heavy surf and paddling off towards the ships but their astonishment may be imagined when on coming alongside they were hailed in good english with won't you heave us a rope now this being done a young man sprang up the side with extraordinary activity and stood on the deck before them in answer to the question who are you he replied that his name was thursday october christian son of the late fletcher christian by an otahitian mother that he was the first born on the island and was so named because he was born on a Thursday in October All this sounded singular and incredible in the ears of the British captains Sir Thomas Staines and mr. Pippin, but they were soon satisfied of its truth Young Christian was at this time about 24 years old a tall handsome youth fully six feet high with black hair and an open interesting English countenance as he wore no clothes except a piece of cloth around his loins and a straw hat ornamented with black cock's feathers his fine figure and well-shaped muscular limbs were displayed to great advantage and attracted general admiration his body was much tanned by exposure to the weather but although his complexion was somewhat brown it wanted that tinge of red peculiar to the natives of the pacific he spoke english correctly both in grammar and pronunciation and his frank and ingenious deportment excited in every one the liveliest feelings of compassion and interest his companion was a fine handsome youth of seventeen or eighteen years of age named george young son of one of the bounty's midshipmen the youths expressed great surprise at everything they saw especially a cow which they supposed to be either a huge goat or a horned sow having never seen any other quadrupeds when questioned concerning the bounty they referred the captains to an old man on shore the only surviving Englishman whose name they said was John Adams but who proved to be the identical Alexander Smith before mentioned having changed his name from some caprice or other the officers went ashore with the youths and were received by old Adams as we shall now call him who conducted them to his house and treated them to an elegant repast of eggs fowl yams plantains breadfruit etc they now learned from him an account of the fate of his companions who with himself preferred accompanying christian in the bounty to remaining at otaheite which account agreed with that he afterwards gave at greater length to captain beachy in 1828 our limits will not permit us to detail all the interesting particulars at length as we could have wished but they are in substance as follows it was christian's object in order to avoid the vengeance of the british law 
to proceed to some unknown and uninhabited island, and the Marquises' islands were first fixed upon. But Christian, on reading Captain Cataret's account of Pitcairn's island, thought it better adapted for the purpose, and shaped his course thither. Having landed and traversed it, they found it every way suitable to their wishes, possessing water, wood, a good soil, and some fruits. Having ascertained all this, they returned on board, and having landed their hogs, goats, and poultry, and gutted the ship of everything that could be useful to them, they set fire to her, and destroyed every vestige that might lead to the discovery of their retreat. This was on the 23rd of January, 1790. The island was then divided into nine equal portions among them, a suitable spot of neutral ground being reserved for a village. The poor Otahitians now found themselves reduced to the condition of mere slaves, but they patiently submitted, and everything went on peaceably for two years. About that time Williams, one of the seamen, having the misfortune to lose his wife, forcibly took the wife of one of the Otahitians, which, together with their continued ill usage, so exasperated the latter that they formed a plan for murdering the whole of their oppressors. The plot, however, was discovered and revealed by the Englishmen's wives, and two of the Otahitians were put to death. But the surviving natives soon afterwards matured a more successful conspiracy, and in one day murdered five of the Englishmen, including Christian. Adams and Young were spared at the intercession of their wives, and the remaining two, McCoy and Quintal, two desperate ruffians, escaped to the mountains, whence, however, they soon rejoined their companions. But the further career of these two villains was short. McCoy, having been bred up in a Scottish distillery, succeeded in extracting a bottle of Arden spirits from the tea root, from which time he and Quintal were never sober, until the former became delirious and committed suicide by jumping over a cliff. Quintal, being likewise almost insane with drinking, made repeated attempts to murder Adams and Young, until they were absolutely compelled, for their own safety, to put him to death which they did by felling him with a hatchet. Adams and Young were at length the only surviving males who had landed on the island, and being both of a serious turn of mind, and having time for reflection and repentance, they became extremely devout. Having saved a Bible and prayer book from the bounty, they now performed family worship morning and evening, and addressed themselves to training up their own children and those of their unfortunate companions in piety and virtue. Young, however, was soon carried off by an asthmatic complaint, and Adams was thus left to continue his pious labors alone. At the time Captains Staines and Pippin visited the island, this interesting little colony consisted of about forty-six persons, mostly grown-up young people, all living in harmony and happiness together, and not only professing, but fully understanding and practicing the precepts and principles of the Christian religion. Adams had instituted the ceremony of marriage, and he assured his visitors that not one instance of debauchery and immoral conduct had occurred amongst them. The visitors, having supplied these interesting people with some tools, kettles, and other articles, took their leave. The account which they transmitted home of this newly discovered colony was, strange to say, as little attended to by government as that of Captain Folger and nothing more was heard of Adams and his family for nearly twelve years, when in 1825 Captain Beechey, in the Blossom, bound on a voyage of discovery to Bering Strait, touched at Pitcairn's Island. On the approach of the Blossom, a boat came off under all sail towards the ship, containing old Adams and ten of the young men of the island. After requesting and obtaining leave to come on board, the young men sprang up the side and shook every officer cordially by the hand. Adams, who was grown very corpulent, followed more leisurely. He was dressed in a sailor suit and trousers, with a low-crowned hat, which he held in his hand in sailor fashion, while he smoothed down his bald forehead when addressed by the officers of the Blossom. The little colony had now increased to about sixty-six, including an English sailor of the name of John Buffett who, at his own earnest desire, had been left by a whaler. In this man the society luckily found an able and willing schoolmaster. He instructed the children in reading, writing, and arithmetic, 
and devoutly cooperated with old Adams in affording religious instruction to the community. The officers of the Blossom went ashore and were entertained with a sumptuous repast at Young Christians, the table being spread with plates, knives, and forks. Buffett said grace in an emphatic manner, and so strict were they in this respect that it was not deemed proper to touch a morsel of bread without saying grace, both before and after it. The officers slept in the house all night, their bedclothing and sheets consisting of the native cloth made of the native mulberry tree. The only interruption to their repose was the melody of the evening hymn, which was chanted together by the whole family after the lights were put out, and they were awakened at early dawn by the same devotional ceremony. On Sabbath, the utmost decorum was attended to, and the day was passed in regular religious observances. In consequence of a representation made by Captain Beechey, the British government sent out Captain Waldegrave in 1830 in the Seringapatam with a supply of sailors' blue jackets and trousers, flannels, stockings, and shoes, women's dresses, spades, mattocks, shovels, pickaxes, trowels, rakes, etc. He found their community increased to about seventy-nine, all exhibiting the same unsophisticated and amiable characteristics as we have before described. Two other Englishmen had settled amongst them, one of them called Nobbs, a low-bred illiterate man, a self-constituted missionary who was endeavoring to supersede Buffett in his office of religious instructor. The patriarch, Adams, it was found, had died in March of 1829, aged sixty-five. While on his deathbed he had called the heads of families together, and urged upon them to elect a chief, which, however, they had not yet done, but the greatest harmony still prevailed amongst them, notwithstanding Nobbs' exertions to form a party of his own. Captain Waldegrave thought that the island, which is about four miles square, might be able to support a thousand persons, upon reaching which number they would naturally emigrate to other islands. Such is the account of this most singular colony, originating in crime and bloodshed. Of all the repentant criminals on record, the most interesting, perhaps, is John Adams, nor do we know where to find a more beautiful example of the value of early instruction than in the history of this man, who, having run the full career of nearly all kinds of vice, was checked by an interval of leisurely reflection, and the sense of new duties, awakened by the power of natural affections. End of Story 1, Part 2 Story 2 of Sea Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper Sea Stories Edited by Cyrus Townsend Brady Story 2 Our First Whale from the Cruise of the Cachalot, by Frank T. Bullen, First Mate. Simultaneous ideas occurring to several people, or thought transference, whatever one likes to call the phenomenon, is too frequent an occurrence in most of our experience to occasion much surprise. Yet on the occasion to which I am about to refer, the matter was so very marked that few of us who took part in the day's proceedings are ever likely to forget it. We were all gathered about the forecastle scuttle one evening, a few days after the gale, and the question of whale-fishing came up for discussion. Until that time, strange as it may seem, no word of this, the central idea of all our minds, had been mooted. Every man seemed to shun the subject although we were in daily expectation of being called upon to take an active part in whale-fighting. Once the ice was broken, nearly all had something to say about it, and very nearly as many addle-headed opinions were ventilated as at a Colney Hatch debating society. For we none of us knew anything about it. 
I was appealed to continually to support this or that theory, but as far as whaling went, I could only, like the rest of them, draw upon my imagination for details. How did a whale act? What were the first steps taken? What chance was there of being saved if your boat got smashed? And so on, unto infinity. At last, getting very tired of this Portuguese parliament, of all talkers and no listeners, I went aft to get a drink of water before turning in. The harpooners and other petty officers were grouped in the waist, earnestly discussing the pros and cons of attack upon whales. As I passed, I heard the mate's harpooner say, Feels like whale about. I'll bet a plug of tobacco we raise a sperm whale tomorrow. Nobody took his bet, for it appeared that they were mostly of the same mind. And while I was drinking, I heard the officers in dignified conclave talking over the same thing. It was Saturday evening, and while at home people were looking forward to a day's respite from work and care, I felt that the coming day, though never taken much notice of on board, was big with the probabilities of strife, such as I at least had at present no idea of. So firmly was I possessed by the prevailing feeling. The night was very quiet. A gentle breeze was blowing, and the sky was of the usual trade character, that is, a dome of dark blue fringed at the horizon with peaceful cumulus clouds, almost motionless. I turned in at 4 a.m. from the middle watch, and, as usual, slept like a babe. Suddenly I started wide awake, a long, mournful sound, sending a thrill to my very heart. As I listened breathlessly, other sounds of the same character, but in different tones, joined in. Human voices, monotonously intoning in long, drawn-out expirations, the single word, Blow! Then came a hurricane of noise overhead, and adjurations in no gentle language to the sleepers to tumble up lively there, no skulking, sperm whales. At last, then, fulfilling all the presentiments of yesterday, the long-dreaded moment had arrived. Happily there was no time for hesitation. In less than two minutes we were all on deck and hurrying to our respective boats. There was no flurry or confusion and except that orders were given more quietly than usual, with a manifest air of suppressed excitement, there was nothing to show that we were not going for an ordinary course of boat drill. The skipper was in the main crow's nest with his binoculars. Presently he shouted, "'Now then, Mr. Count, lower away soon's you like. Small pod of cows, and one or two bulls layin' off to the westward of em. Down went the boats into the water, quietly enough, and we all scrambled in and shoved off. A stroke or two of the oars were given to get clear of the ship and one another. Then oars were shipped, and up went the sails. As I took my allotted place at the main sheet, and the beautiful craft started off like some big bird, Mr. Count leaned forward, saying impressively to me, "'You're a smart youngster, and I've kinder took to you.' "'But don't you look ahead and get gollied, or I'll knock you stiff with the tiller, do you hear me? "'And don't you dare to make that sheet fast, or you'll die so sudden you won't know where you're herded.' "'I said as cheerfully as I could, "'All right, sir, trying to look unconcerned, telling myself not to be a coward, and all sorts of things. "'But the cold truth is that I was scared almost to death, because I didn't know what was coming. "'However, I did the best thing under the circumstances.' obeyed orders, and looked steadily astern, or up into the bronzed, impassive face of my chief, who towered above me, scanning with eagle eyes the sea ahead. The other boats were coming flying along behind us, spreading wider apart as they came, while in the bows of each the harpooner stood with his right hand upon his fist-iron, which lay ready, pointing over the bow, in a raised fork of wood called the crutch. All of a sudden, at a motion of the chief's hand, the peak of our mainsail was dropped, and the boat swung up into the wind, 
lying hove to, almost stationary. The centerboard was lowered to stop her drifting to leeward, although I cannot say it made much difference that ever I saw. Now what's the matter, I thought, when to my amazement the chief, addressing me, said, "'Wonder why we've hauled up, don't you?' "'Yes, sir, I do,' said I. "'Well,' said he, "'the fish have sounded, and if we run over em we've seen the last of em. So we wait a while till they rise again, and then we'll probably get thar thereabouts before they sound again.' With this explanation I had to be content, although if it be no clearer to my readers than it was then to me, I shall have to explain myself more fully later on. Silently we lay, rocking lazily upon the gentle swell, no other word being spoken by any one. At last Lewis, the harpooner, gently breathed, Blow! And there, sure enough, not half a mile away, on the lee beam, was a little bushy cloud of steam apparently rising from the sea. At almost the same time as we kept away, all the other boats did likewise. And just then, catching sight of the ship, the reason for this apparently concerted action was explained. At the main masthead of the ship was a square blue flag, and the ensign at the peak was being dipped. These were signals well understood and promptly acted upon by those in charge of the boats who were thus guided from a point of view at least one hundred feet above the sea. "'Stand up, Louis,' the mate murmured softly. I only just stopped myself in time from turning my head to see why the order was given. Suddenly there was a bump. At the same moment the mate yelled, "'Give it to him, Louis, give it to him!' And to me, "'Haul that main sheet now, haul, why don't you?' I hauled it flat aft, and the boat shot up into the wind, rubbing sides as she did so, with what to my troubled sight seemed an enormous mass of black India rubber floating. As we crawled up into the wind, the whale went into convulsions befitting his size and energy. He raised a gigantic tail on high, thrashing the water with deafening blows, rolling at the same time from side to side until the surrounding sea was white with froth. I felt in an agony lest we should be crushed under one of those fearful strokes, for Mr. Count appeared to be oblivious of possible danger, although we seemed to be now drifting back on to the writhing leviathan. In the agitated condition of the sea it was a task of no ordinary difficulty to unship the tall mast, which was of course the first thing to be done. After a desperate struggle, and a narrow escape from falling overboard of one of the men, we got the long stick with the sail bundled around it, down and fleeted aft, where it was secured by the simple means of sticking the heel under the after thwart, two-thirds of the mast extending out over the stern. Meanwhile we had certainly been in a position of greatest danger, our immunity from damage being unquestionably due to anything but precaution taken to avoid it. By the time the oars were handled and the mate had exchanged places with the harpooner, our friend the enemy had sounded. That is, he had gone below for a change of scene, marvelling, no doubt, what strange thing had befallen him. Agreeably to the accounts, which I, like most boys, had read of the whale fishery, I looked for the rushing of the line around the loggerhead, a stout wooden post built into the boat aft, to raise a cloud of smoke with occasional bursts of flame. So as it began to slowly surge round the post, I timidly asked the harpooner whether I should throw any water on it. "'What for?' growled he, as he took a couple more turns with it. Not knowing what for, and hardly liking to quote my authorities here, I said no more, but waited events. "'Hold him up, Louis, hold him up, can't you?' shouted the mate. And to my horror, down went the nose of the boat, almost under water, while at the mate's order everybody scrambled aft into the elevated stern sheets. The line sang quite a tune as it was grudgingly allowed to surge round the loggerhead, filling one with admiration at the strength shown by such a small rope. This sort of thing went on for about twenty minutes, 
in which time we quite emptied the large tub and began on the small one. As there was nothing whatever for us to do while this was going on, I had ample leisure for observing the little game that was being played about a quarter of a mile away. Mr. Cruz, the second mate, had got a whale, and was doing his best to kill it, but he was severely handicapped by his crew, or rather had been, for two of them were now temporarily incapable of either good or harm. They had gone quite batchy with fright, requiring a not too gentle application of the tiller to their heads in order to keep them quiet. The remedy, if rough, was effectual, for the subsequent proceedings interested them no more. Consequently, his maneuvers were not so well or rapidly executed as he doubtless could have wished, though his energy in lancing that whale was something to admire and remember. Hatless, his shirt-tail out of the waist of his trousers, streaming behind him like a banner, he lunged and thrust at the whale alongside of him, as if possessed of a destroying devil, while his half-articulate yells of rage and blasphemy were audible even to us. Suddenly our boat fell backward from her slantendicular position with a jerk, and the mate immediately shouted, "'Haul line there! Look lively now, you!' So on, etc., etc. He seemed to invent new epithets on every occasion. The line came in hand over hand, and was coiled in a wide heap in the stern sheets, for silky as it was, it could not be expected in its wet state to lie very close. As it came flying in, the mate kept a close gaze upon the water immediately beneath us, apparently for the first glimpse of our antagonist. When the whale broke water, however, he was some distance off, and apparently as quiet as a lamb. Now, had Mr. Count been a prudent or less ambitious man, our task would doubtless have been an easy one, or comparatively so. But being a little over-grasping, he got us all into serious trouble. We were hauling up to our whale in order to lance it, and the mate was standing, lance in hand, only waiting to get near enough, when up comes a large whale right alongside of our boat, so close, indeed, that I might have poked my finger in his little eye if I had chosen. The sight of that whale, at liberty, and calmly taking stock of us like that, was too much for the mate. He lifted his lance and hurled it at the visitor, in whose broad flank it sank like a knife into butter, right up to the pole hitches. The recipient disappeared like a flash, but before one had time to think there was an awful crash beneath us, and the mate shot up into the air like a bomb from a mortar. He came down in a sitting posture on the mast thwart, but as he fell the whole framework of the boat collapsed like a derelict umbrella. Lewis quietly chopped the line and severed our connection with the other whale, while in accordance with our instructions we drew each man his oar across the boat and lashed it firmly down with a piece of line spliced to each thwart for the purpose. This simple operation took but a minute, but before it was completed we were all up to our necks in the sea. Still in the boat, it is true, and therefore not in such danger of drowning as if we were quite adrift. But considering that the boat was reduced to a mere bundle of loose planks, I, at any rate, was none too comfortable. Now, had he known it, was the whale's golden opportunity. But he, poor wretch, had had quite enough of our company, and cleared off without any delay, wondering, no doubt, what fortunate accident had rid him of our very unpleasant attentions. I was assured that we were all as safe as if we were on board the ship, to which I answered nothing, but, like Jack's parrot, I did some powerful thinking. Every little wave that came along swept clean over our heads, sometimes coming so suddenly as to cut a breath in half. If the wind should increase... But no, I wouldn't face the possibility of such a disagreeable thing. I was cool enough now, in a double sense, for although we were in the tropics we soon got thoroughly chilled. By the position of the sun it must have been between 10 a.m. and noon, and we of the crew had eaten nothing since the previous day at supper, when, as usual, the meal was very light. 
therefore i suppose we felt the chill sooner than the better nourished mate and harpooner who looked rather scornfully at our blue faces and chattering teeth in spite of all assurances to the contrary i have not the least doubt in my own mind that a very little longer would have relieved us of all our burdens finally because the heave of the sea had so loosened the shattered planks upon which we stood that they were on the verge of falling all asunder had they done so we must have drowned for we were cramped and stiff with cold and our constrained position however unknown to us a bright lookout upon our movements had been kept from the crow's nest the whole time we should have been relieved long before but that the whale killed by the second mate was being secured and another boat the fourth mate's being picked up having a hole in her bilge you could put your head through with all these hindrances especially securing the whale we were fortunate to be rescued as soon as we were since it is well known that whales are of much higher commercial value than men however help came at last and we were hauled alongside long exposure had weakened us to such an extent that it was necessary to hoist us on board especially the mate whose sudden stop when he returned to us after his little aerial excursion had shaken his sturdy frame considerably a state of body which his subsequent soaking had by no means improved in my innocence i imagined that we should be commiserated for our misfortunes by captain slocum and certainly be relieved from further duties until we were a little recovered from the rough treatment we had just undergone but i never made a greater mistake the skipper cursed us all except the mate whose sole fault the accident undoubtedly was with a fluidity and vigor that was to put it mildly discouraging moreover we were informed that he wouldn't have no adjective skulking that we must turn to and do something after wasting the ship's time and property in such a blank manner there was a limit however to our obedience so although we could not move at all for a while his threats were not proceeded with farther than theory a couple of slings were passed around the boat by means of which she was carefully hoisted on board a mere dilapidated bundle of sticks and raffle of gear she was at once removed aft out of the way the business of cutting in the whale claiming precedence over everything else just then the preliminary proceedings consisted of rigging the cutting stage this was composed of two stout planks a foot wide and ten feet long the inner ends of which were suspended by strong ropes over the ship's side about four feet from the water while the outer extremities were upheld by tackles from the main rigging and a small crane abreast the tryworks these planks were about thirty feet apart their two outer ends being connected by a massive plank which was securely bolted to them a handrail about as high as a man's waist supported by light iron stanchions ran the full length of this plank on the side nearest the ship the whole fabric forming an admirable standing place from whence the officers might standing in comparative comfort cut and carve at a great mass below to their heart's content so far the prize had been simply held alongside by the whale line which at death had been rove through a hole cut in the solid grizzle of the tail but now it became necessary to secure the carcass to the ship in some more permanent fashion therefore a massive chain like a small ship's cable was brought forward and in a very ingenious way by means of a tiny buoy and a hand lead passed round the body one end brought through a ring in the other and hauled upon until it fitted tight round the small or part of the whale next to the broad spread of the tail the free end of the fluke chain was then passed in through a mooring pipe forward firmly secured to a massive bit at the heel of the bowsprit the fluke chain bit and all was ready if too much stress has been laid upon the smashing of our own boat and consequent sufferings while little or no notice was taken of the kindred disaster to mr jones's vessel 
my excuse must be that the experience filled me right up to the chin as the mate concisely if inelegantly put it poor goliath was indeed to be pitied for his well-known luck and capacity as a whaleman seemed on this occasion to have quite deserted him not only had his boat been stove upon first getting on to the whale but he hadn't even had a run for his money it appeared that upon striking his whale a small lively cow she had at once settled allowing the boat to run over her but just as they were passing she rose gently enough her pointed hump piercing the thin skin of half-inch cedar as if it had been cardboard she settled again immediately leaving a hole behind her a foot long by six inches wide which effectually put a stop to all further fishing operations on the part of goliath and his merry men for that day at any rate it was all so quiet and so tame and so stupid no wonder mr jones felt savage when captain slocum's fluent profanity flickered around him including vehemently all he might be supposed to have any respect for he did not even look as if he would like to talk back he only looked sick and tired of being himself the third mate again was of a different category altogether he had distinguished himself by missing every opportunity of getting near a whale while there was a loose one about and then saving the crew of goliath's boat who were really in no danger whatsoever his iniquity was too great to be dealt with by mere bad language he crept about like a homeless dog much i am afraid to my secret glee for i couldn't help remembering his untiring cruelty to the green hands on first leaving port in consequence of these little drawbacks we were not a very jovial crowd forward or aft not that hilarity was ever particularly noticeable among us but just now there was a very decided sense of wrongdoing over us all and a general fear that each of us was about to pay the penalty due to some other delinquent. But fortunately there was work to be done. Oh, blessed work! How many awkward situations you have extricated people from! How many distracted brains have you soothed and restored by your steady, irresistible pressure of duty to be done and brooking no delay! The first thing to be done was to cut the whale's head off, this operation involving the greatest amount of labor in the whole of the cutting in was taken in hand by the first and second mates who armed with twelve-foot spades took their station upon the stage leaned over the handrail to steady themselves and plunged their weapons vigorously down through the massive neck of the animal if neck it could be said to have following a well-defined crease in the blubber at the same time the other officers passed a heavy chain sling around the long narrow lower jaw hooking one of the big cutting tackle into it the fall of which was then taken to the windlass and hove tight turning the whale on her back a deep cut was then made on both sides of the rising jaw the windlass was kept going and gradually the whole of the throat was raised high enough for a hole to be cut through its mass into which the strap of the second cutting tackle was inserted and secured by passing a huge toggle of oak through its eye the second tackle was then hove taut and the jaw with a large piece of blubber attached was cut off from the body with a boarding knife a tool not unlike a cutlass blade set into a three foot long wooden handle upon being severed the whole piece swung easily inboard and was lowered on deck the fast tackle was now hove upon while the third mate on the stage cut down diagonally into the blubber on the body which the purchase ripped off in a broad strip or blanket about five feet wide and a foot thick meanwhile the other two officers carved away vigorously at the head varying their labors by cutting a hole right through the snout this when completed received a heavy chain for the purpose of securing the head when the blubber had been about half stripped off the body a halt was called in order that the work of cutting off the head might be finished for it was a task of incredible difficulty it was accomplished at last 
and the mass floated astern by a stout rope, after which the windless poles clattered merrily, the blankets rose in quick succession, and were cut off and lowered into the square of the main hatch or blubber room. A short time sufficed to strip off the whole of the body blubber, and when at last the tail was reached, the backbone was cut through, the huge mass of flesh floating away to feed the innumerable scavengers of the sea. No sooner was the last of the blubber lowered into the hold, than the hatches were put on, and the head hauled up alongside. Both tackles were secured to it, and all hands took to the windlass levers. This was a small cow whale of about thirty barrels, that is, yielding that amount of oil, so it was just possible to lift the entire head on board. But as it weighed as much as three full-grown elephants, it was indeed a heavy lift even for our united forces, trying our tackle to the utmost. The weather was very fine, and the ship rolled but little. Even then the strain upon the mast was terrific, and right glad was I when at last the immense cube of fat, flesh, and bone was eased inboard and gently lowered on deck. As soon as it was secured, the work of dividing it began. From the snout a triangular mass was cut, which was more than half pure spermaceti. This substance was contained in spongy cells, held together by layers of dense white fiber, exceedingly tough and elastic, and called by the whalers white horse. The whole mass, or junk as it is called, was hauled away to the ship's side, and firmly lashed to the bulwarks for the time being, so that it might not take charge of the deck during the rest of the operations. The upper part of the head was now split open lengthwise, disclosing an oblong cistern or case, full of liquid spermaceti clear as water. This was baled out with buckets into a tank, concreting as it cooled into a wax-like substance, bland and tasteless. There being now nothing more remaining about the skull of any value, the lashings were loosed, and the first leeward roll sent the great mass plunging overboard with a mighty splash. It sank like a stone, eagerly followed by a few small sharks that were hovering near. As may be imagined, so much oil was running about the deck, for so saturated was every part of the creature with it, that it really gushed like water during the cutting-up process. None of it was allowed to run to waste, though, for the scupper-holes which drained the deck were all carefully plugged, and as soon as the junk had been dissected, all the oil was carefully squeegeed up and poured into the tripots. Two men were now told off as blubber-room men, whose duty it became to go below, and squeezing themselves in as best they could between the greasy masses of fat, cut it up into horse-pieces, about eighteen inches long and six inches broad. Doing this they became perfectly saturated with oil, as if they had taken a bath in a tank of it, for as the vessel rolled it was impossible to maintain a footing, and every fall was upon blubber running with oil. A machine of wonderful construction had been erected on deck, in a kind of shallow trough about six feet long by four feet wide and a foot deep. At some remote period of time it had no doubt been looked upon as a triumph of ingenuity, a patent mincing machine. Its action was somewhat like that of a chaff-cutter, except that the knife was not attached to the wheel, and only rose and fell, since it was not required to cut right through the horse-pieces with which it was fed. It will be readily understood that in order to get the oil quickly out of the blubber, it needs to be sliced as thin as possible, but for convenience in handling the refuse, which is the only fuel used, it is not chopped up in small pieces, but every horse piece is very deeply scored, as it were, leaving a thin strip to hold the slices together. This, then, was the order of work. Two harpooners attended the tripots, replenishing them with minced blubber from the hopper at the port side, and bailing out the sufficiently boiled oil into the great cooling tank on the starboard. One officer superintended the mincing, 
another exercised a general supervision over all. There was no man at the wheel, and no lookout, for the vessel was hove to, under two close-reefed topsails and a foretopmast staysail, with the wheel lashed hard down. A lookout man was unnecessary, since we could not run anybody down, and if anybody ran us down, it would only be because all hands were asleep, for the glare of our triworks fire, to say nothing of the blazing cresset before mentioned, could have been seen for many miles. So we toiled, watch and watch, six hours on and six off, the work never ceasing for an instant, night or day. Though the work was hard and dirty, and the discomfort of being so continually wet through with oil great, there was only one thing dangerous about the whole business. That was the job of filling and shifting the huge casks of oil. Some of these were of enormous size, containing three hundred and fifty gallons when full, and the work of moving them about the greasy deck of a rolling ship was attended with a terrible amount of risk for only four men at most could get fair hold of a cask, and when she took it into her silly old hull to start rolling, just as we had got one halfway across the deck, with nothing to grip your feet, and the knowledge that one stumbling man would mean a sudden slide of a ton and a half weight, and a little heap of mangled corpses somewhere in the lee scuppers, well, one always wanted to be very thankful when the lashings were safely passed. The whale being a small one, as before noted, the whole business was over within three days, and the decks scrubbed and re-scrubbed until they had quite regained their normal whiteness. The oil was poured by means of a funnel and long canvas hose into the casks stowed in the ground tier at the bottom of the ship, and the gear, all carefully cleaned and neatly stopped up, stowed snugly away below again. This long and elaborate process is quite different from that followed on board the Arctic whale ships, whose voyages are of short duration, and who content themselves with merely cutting the blubber up small and bringing it home to have the oil expressed. But the awful putrid mass discharged from a Greenlander's hold is of a very different quality and value, apart from the nature of the substance from the clear and sweet oil which after three years in cask is landed from a south seaman as inoffensive in smell and flavor as the day it was shipped no attempt is made to separate the oil and spermaceti beyond boiling the head matter as it is called by itself first and putting it into casks which are not filled up with the body oil spermaceti exists in all the oil especially that from the dorsal hump but it is left for the refiners ashore to extract and leave the oil quite free from any admixture of the wax-like substance, which causes it to become solid at temperatures considerably above the freezing point. Uninteresting as this preceding description may be, it is impossible to understand anything of the economy of a South Sea whaler without giving it, and I have felt it the more necessary because of the scanty notice given to it in the only two works published on the subject, both of them highly technical, and written for scientific purposes by medical men. Therefore I hope to be forgiven if I have tried the patience of my readers by any prolixity. It will not, of course, have escaped the reader's notice that I have not hitherto attempted to give any details concerning the structure of the whale just dealt with. The omission is intentional. During this, our first attempt at real whaling, my mind was far too disturbed by the novelty and danger of the position in which I found myself for the first time for me to pay any intelligent attention to the party of the second part but I may safely promise that, from the workman's point of view, the habits, manners, and build of the whales shall be faithfully described, as I saw them during my long acquaintance with them, earnestly hoping that if my story be not as technical or scientific as that of Drs. Bennett and Beale, it may be found fully as accurate and reliable. And perhaps the reader, being like myself a mere layman, so to speak, 
may be better able to appreciate description free from scientific formula and nine-jointed words. Two things I did notice on this occasion, which I will briefly allude to before closing this chapter. One was the peculiar skin of the whale. It was a bluish-black, and as thin as gold-beater's skin, so thin indeed and tender that it was easily scraped off with the finger-nail. Immediately beneath it, upon the surface of the blubber, was a layer or coating of what, for want of a better simile, I must call fine short fur, although unlike fur it had no roots, or apparently any hold upon the blubber. Neither was it attached to the skin which covered it. In fact, it seemed merely a sort of packing between the skin and the surface of the thick layer of solid fat which covered the whole area of the whale's body. The other matter which impressed me was the peculiarity of the teeth. For up till that time I had held, in common with most seamen, and landsmen too for that matter, the prevailing idea that a whale lived by suction, although I did not at all know what that meant, and that it was impossible for him to swallow a herring. Yet here was a mouth manifestly intended for greater things in the way of gastronomy than herrings, nor did it require more than the most casual glances to satisfy one of so obvious a fact. Then the teeth were heroic in size, protruding some four or five inches from the gum, and solidly set more than that into its firm and compact substance. They were certainly not intended for mastication, being where thickest three inches apart, and tapering to a short point, curving slightly backwards. In this specimen, a female, and therefore small, as I have said, there were twenty of them on each side, the last three or four near the gullet being barely visible above the gum. Another most convincing reason why no mastication could have been possible was that there were no teeth visible in the upper jaw. Opposed to each of the teeth was a socket where a tooth should apparently have been, and this was conclusive evidence of the soft and yielding nature of the great creature's food. But there were signs that at some period of the development of the whale it had possessed a double row of teeth, because at the bottom of these upper sockets we found in a few cases what seemed to be an abortive tooth, not one that was growing because they had no roots, but a survival of teeth that had once been perfect and useful, but from disuse or lack of necessity for them had gradually ceased to come to maturity. The interior of the mouth and throat was of a livid white, and the tongue was quite small for so large an animal. It was almost incapable of movement, being somewhat like a fowl's. Certainly it could not have been protruded even from the angle of the mouth, much less have extended along the parapet of that lower mandible, which reminded one of the beak of some mighty albatross or stork. End of Story 2 Biographical Notes Frank T. Bullen, English author and lecturer, born 1857, educated at a dame school, started life as an errand boy. From 1869 to 1883 was at sea, in all capacities, up to and including chief mate then clerk in the English Meteorological Office until 1899. In addition to the cruise of the Cachalot, he has written Idols of the Sea, The Log of a Sea Waif, The Men of the Merchant Service, With Christ at Sea, and many articles, poems, and sketches. Story 3 of Sea Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sea Stories, edited by Cyrus Townsend Brady. Story 3. 
Going to Sea a Hundred Years Ago, from a narrative of voyages by R. J. Cleveland. In the ordinary course of a commercial education in New England, boys are transferred from school to the merchant's desk at the age of fourteen or fifteen. When I had reached my fourteenth year, it was my good fortune to be received into the counting house of Elias Haskett Derby, Esquire of Salem, a merchant who may justly be termed the father of the American commerce to India one whose enterprise and commercial sagacity were unequaled in his day, and perhaps have not been surpassed by any of his successors. To him our country is indebted for opening the valuable trade to Calcutta, before whose fortress his was the first vessel to display the American flag. And following up the business, he had reaped golden harvests before other merchants came in for a share of them. The first American ships seen at the Cape of Good Hope and at the Isle of France belonged to him. His were the first American ships which carried cargoes of cotton from Bombay to China, and among the first ships which made a direct voyage to China and back was one owned by him. He continued to prosecute a successful business on an extensive scale in those countries until the day of his death. In the transaction of his affairs abroad, he was liberal, greatly beyond the practice in modern times, always desirous that everyone, even the foremost hand, should share the good fortune to which he pointed the way. And the long list of masters of ships who acquired ample fortunes in his employment is a proof, both of his discernment in selecting and of his generosity in paying them. Without possessing a scientific knowledge of the construction and sparring of ships, Mr. Derby seemed to have an intuitive faculty in judging of models and proportions, and his experiments in several instances for the attainment of swiftness of sailing were crowned with a success unsurpassed in our own or any other country. He built several ships for the India trade, immediately in the vicinity of the counting house, which afforded me an opportunity of becoming acquainted with the building, sparring, and rigging of ships. The conversations to which I listened, relating to the countries then newly visited by Americans, the excitement on the return of an adventure from them, and the great profits which were made, always manifest from the result of my own little adventures, tended to stimulate the desire in me of visiting those countries, and of sharing more largely in the advantages they presented. Consequently, after having passed four years in this course of instruction, I became impatient to begin that nautical career on which I had determined as presenting the most sure and direct means of arriving at independence, and in the summer of 1792 I embarked on my first voyage. It was one of only three months' duration, but it was sufficient to produce the most thorough disgust of the pursuit from the severe suffering of seasickness so that if I had perceived on my return any prospect of shore equally promising, I should have abandoned the sea. None, however, presenting itself, I persevered and finally overcame the difficulty. Having in this and other voyages to the East and West Indies and to Europe, acquired the experience and nautical skill deemed sufficient to qualify me for taking the command of a ship, I was invited in the autumn of 1795 by the eldest son of Mr. Derby take charge of his bark enterprise and proceed on a voyage to the Isle of Bourbon. The confidence thus evinced in entrusting the management of a valuable vessel and cargo to so young and inexperienced a man, why I had then only attained my majority, was very gratifying to my ambition and was duly appreciated. In those almost primitive days of our commerce, a coppered vessel was scarcely known in the United States and on the long East India voyages the barnacles and grass which accumulated on a wooden sheathing retarded the ship's sailing so much that a third more time at least was required for the passages than is needed since the practice of sheathing with copper has been adopted. A year, therefore, was generally consumed in a voyage to the Isle of France or Bourbon, and mine was accomplished within that term. The success attending it was very satisfactory to my employer, of which he gave evidence in dispatching me again, in the same vessel, on a voyage to Europe, and thence to Mocha for a cargo of coffee. While at Havre de Grace in the summer of 1797, engaged in making preparations for pursuing the voyage, 
I had the mortification to learn by letters from my employer that some derangement had occurred in his affairs, which made it necessary to abandon the Mocha enterprise, and to place in his hands with the least possible delay the funds destined for that object. Among the numerous commercial adventures in which our merchants at that time had been engaged to the eastward of the Cape of Good Hope, no voyage had been undertaken to Mocha. To be the first, therefore, in an untried adventure was highly gratifying to my ambition, and my disappointment was proportionately great when compelled to relinquish it. To have detained the vessel in France while waiting the slow progress of the sale of the cargo would have been injudicious. She was therefore dispatched for home under charge of the mate, William Webb of Salem. Being thus relieved from the necessity of an immediate return to the United States, I flattered myself that even with the very contracted means which I possessed, I might still engage, with a little assistance and on a very humble scale, in some enterprise to the Isle of France and India. When, therefore, I had accomplished the business with which I had been charged, by remitting to the owner in Salem his property with me, I began earnestly to put to the test the practicability of the object of which I was so desirous. A coincidence of favorable and very encouraging circumstances aided my views. A friend of mine had become proprietor of a little cutter of thirty-eight tons burden, which had been a packet between Dover and Calais. This vessel had been taken for a debt, and the owner, not knowing what to do with her, offered her to me for a reasonable price, and to pay when I had the ability. The credit would enable me to put all my capital in the cargo, excepting what was required for coppering and fitting the cutter for the contemplated voyage, about five hundred dollars, leaving me fifteen hundred to be invested in the cargo. On making known to others of my friends the plan of my voyage, two of them engaged to embark to the amount of a thousand dollars each, on condition of sharing equally the profits at the end of the voyage. Having become proprietor of the cutter, which with all additional expenses cost ready for sea, about one thousand dollars, an investment of articles best suited to the market of the Isle of France was purchased to the amount of three thousand five hundred dollars, making vessel and cargo amount to four thousand five hundred. It is not probable that the annals of commerce can furnish another example of an Indiaman and cargo being fitted and expedited on so humble a scale. I had now the high gratification of uncontrolled action, an innate love of independence and impatience of restraint and aversion to responsibility, and a desire to have no other limits to my wanderings than the globe itself, reconciled me to the endurance of fatigues and privations, which I knew to be the unavoidable consequence of navigating in so frail a bark. Rather than to possess the comparative ease and comfort coupled with the restraint and responsibility which the command of a fine ship belonging to another would present. As there are doubtless many persons, not excepting those even who are familiar with commercial and maritime affairs, who will view this enterprise as very hazardous from sea risk, and as offering but a very small prospect of emolument, it is proper, so far as I am able, to do away with such impressions by briefly stating the object I had in view. On my late voyage to the Isle of Bourbon, I had perceived a great deficiency in the number of vessels requisite for the advantageous conveyance of passengers and freight to and from the Isles of France and Bourbon. If my cutter had been built expressly for the purpose, she could not have been more suitable. With a large and beautifully finished cabin, where passengers would be more comfortably accommodated than in many vessels of greater dimensions, with but small freighting room, and requiring therefore but little time to load, and of greater speed in sailing than the generality of merchant vessels, I had no doubt of being able to sell her there for more than double the cost, or I might find it to be more advantageous to employ her in freighting between the islands. In either event, I felt entire confidence in being amply remunerated for the time and risk. On the cargo, composed of such articles as my late experience had proved to be the most in demand, I had no doubt of making a profit of from fifty to one hundred percent on its cost. The proceeds of the vessel and cargo, invested in the produce of the island and shipped to Europe and the United States, would at that time have yielded a clear gain of thirty-three and one-third percent. Thus, in the course of one year, I should make two hundred percent on the original capital, 
a result which might be considered abundant compensation for the time it would consume, and should take from the enterprise the character of Quixoteism with which it had been stigmatized. As soon as it became known at Havre that my destination was the Isle of France, some of my friends, anxious for my safety, and perceiving in the enterprise only the ardor and temerity of inexperienced youth, endeavored to dissuade me from it by painting to me in glowing colors the distress and probable destruction I was preparing for myself and men. But however friendly and considerate the advice, I felt myself more competent to judge of the risk than they were, and consequently disregarded them. The vessel being already for sea on the 20th of September, 1797, was detained several days by the difficulty of procuring men. Those who were engaged one day would desert the next, and the dangerous character of the enterprise having been discussed and admitted among the seamen in port, I began to be seriously apprehensive that I might not succeed in procuring a crew. At length, however, with much difficulty and some additional pay, I succeeded in procuring four men, and having previously engaged a mate, our number was complete. To delay proceeding to sea a moment longer than necessary would have been incurring a risk of the loss of my men and the pay I had advanced them. Hence I was induced to sail when appearances were very inauspicious. A strong north wind was blowing into the bay with such violence as already to have raised a considerable sea, but I flattered myself that as the sun declined it would abate, that if we could weather Cape Balfour we should make a free wind down channel and that, if this should be found impracticable, we could at all events return to Havre Roads and wait there for a more favorable opportunity. The Storm With such impressions we sailed from Havre on the 25th of September. A great crowd had assembled on the pierhead to witness our departure, and cheered us as we passed. It was about noon, and we were under full sail, but we had scarcely been out two hours when we were obliged to reduce it to a double-reefed mainsail, foresail, and second-sized jib. With the sail even thus diminished, the vessel at times almost buried herself. Still, as every part of the equipment was new and strong, I flattered myself with being able to weather the cape and press forward through a sea in which we were continually enveloped cheered with the hope that we had nothing worse to experience, and that we should soon be relieved by the ability to bear away and make a free wind. I was destined, however, to a sad disappointment, for the wind and sea having increased toward midnight, an extraordinary plunge into a very short and sharp sea completely buried the vessel, and with a heavy crash snapped off the bowsprit by the board. The vessel then left into the wind in defiance of the helm, and the first shake of the foresail stripped it from the belt rope. No other alternative now presented than to endeavor to regain the port of Havre, a task under existing circumstances of very difficult and doubtful accomplishment. The sea had increased in so great a degree and ran so sharp that we were in continual apprehension of having our decks swept. This circumstance, combined with a seasickness which none escaped, retarded and embarrassed the operation of wearing round on the other tack. The violent motion of the vessel had also prevented the possibility of attaining sleep. Indeed, no person had been permitted to go below before the disaster, and none had the disposition to do so afterward. But all were alert in the performance of their duty, which had for its immediate object the getting of the vessel's head pointed towards Havre. This was at length effected, but as we had no spar suitable for the jury bowsprit, we could carry only such part of our mainsail as was balanced by a jib set in the place of a foresail. With this sail we made so much leeway that it was evident as soon as daylight enabled me to form a judgment that we could not reach Havre, nor was it less evident that nothing but an abatement of the gale could save us from being stranded before night. With the hope of this abatement, the heavens were watched with an intensity of interest more easily imagined than described. But no favorable sign appeared, and before noon we had evidence of being to leeward of the port of Havre. We now cleared away the cables and anchors, and secured with battens the communications with the cabin and forecastle. While thus engaged, the man at the masthead announced the appalling but expected intelligence of breakers under the lee. This information had the effect of an electric shock to rouse the crew from that apathy 
which was a natural consequence of twenty-four hours' exposure to great fatigue, incessant wet and cold, and want of sleep and food, for we had not been able to cook anything. The rapidity with which we were driven to leeward soon made the breakers discernible from the deck, and they were of such extent as to leave us no choice, whether we headed east or west, for the forlorn hope of being held by our anchors was all that remained to us. No one on board possessed any knowledge of the shore we were approaching, but our chart denoted it as rocky. It was easy to perceive that to be thrown among rocks by such a sea must be the destruction of us all. Hence it was of the utmost importance to discover and to anchor off the part of the shore which appeared to be most free from rocks, and with this view the mate was looking out from the masthead, as he perceived an apparently clear beach east of us and within our ability of reaching, we steered for it, and when the water was only six fathoms deep, we lowered our sails and came to anchor. But as our anchor dragged, a second was let go, which for a moment only brought the vessel head to the sea. When one cable parted, and as we were drifting rapidly with the other, we cut it, then hoisted the jib and steered directly for the clear space in the beach. Going in with great velocity on the top of a high breaker, we were soon enveloped in its foam, and in that of several others which succeeded. The vessel, however, notwithstanding, she struck the ground with a violence which appeared sufficient to dash her to pieces, still held together, in defiance of this and several minor shocks, and as the tide was falling, she soon became so still and the water so shoal as to enable us to go on shore. As the alarm gun had been fired, the peasantry had come down in great numbers, and when they perceived us leaving the vessel, they ran into the surf, and with such demonstrations of humanity and kindness as our forlorn situation was calculated to excite, supported us to the shore, which we had no sooner reached than they complimented us on the judicious selection we had made of a place to come on shore. And it was now obvious to us that if we had struck half a mile either on one side or the other from this spot, there would have been scarce a possibility of saving our lives. We were fortunate not only in the selection of the spot, but also in the circumstance of its being nearly high water when the vessel struck. The concurrence of two such circumstances turned the scale in my favor, and immediately after landing I was convinced that the vessel and cargo, though much damaged, would both be saved. When the tide had so fallen as to leave the vessel dry, the inhabitants showed no disposition to take advantage of our distress by stipulating for a certain proportion of what they might save before going to work, but prompted by their humane feelings set about discharging the vessel in such numbers and with such earnestness that before sunset she was completely unloaded and the cargo carried above high water mark. The gale toward evening had very much abated and before the next high water was fortunately succeeded by a calm and a great decrease of sea. In the meantime, the leaks made in the bottom were stopped, as well as time and circumstances would permit. An anchor was carried as far as the retreat of the tide would admit, and the cable hove taut. Having made these dispositions, I had gauged a pilot and a sufficient number of men to attend at full tide to heave the vessel off and to endeavor to remove her into the river Orm which was nearby. These arrangements being made, I went with my men to an inn in the neighboring town of Ostraham to get some refreshment and to pass the night, compelled by exhaustion to place entire dependence on those who were strangers to us for getting the vessel afloat, as well as to secure the cargo from being plundered. Though worn out by fatigue and anxiety, my distress of mind was so great that I could not sleep the thoughts that I had contracted a debt which I might never be able to pay, that no insurance had been effective, that without credit I might be compelled to sacrifice what had been saved to defray the expenses incurred, and that my fortune and prospects were ruined, were so incessantly haunting my imagination that the night rather added to than diminished my feelings of exhaustion. The following morning I found the vessel lying safely in the river Orm, and men were also there, ready to make those temporary repairs which were indispensable to enable us to return to Havre. In the forenoon it was required of me to go to Cayenne, two or three miles distant, for the purpose of making the customary report to the municipal authorities, 
which was a business of very little intricacy and of very speedy accomplishment. An examination of the vessel and cargo satisfied me that the former could be repaired at a very trifling expense and that the latter was not damaged to much amount. The alacrity to render us assistance in the people of this place from the beginning of our disaster was extended to the period when, the cargo having been transported to the vessel and reshipped, we were prepared to return to Havre. As in cases of vessels stranding, it seems to be a practice sanctioned by long-established usage, particularly on the other side of the channel, to consider the unfortunate as those abandoned by heaven, from whom may lawfully be taken all that the elements have spared. I was prepared for demand of salvage to a considerable amount, but in this expectation I found I had done great injustice to these good people, for on presenting their account it appeared that they had charged no more than for ordinary labor, and that at a very moderate rate. It is a circumstance also very creditable to them, that notwithstanding some packages of the cargo of much value, and of such bulk as to be easily concealed, were in their possession exclusively for several days and nights, yet nothing was lost. Although these transactions are of a date so remote, probably many of the actors therein have ceased from their earthly labors, yet I never recalled them to mind without a feeling of compunction that I had not ascertained the names of the principals in the business, and made that public acknowledgment for the disinterested and important services rendered me, which gratitude no less than justice demanded. For this omission, my perturbed state of mind is my only apology. With a favorable wind for Havre, we proceeded for that port, where we arrived in about ten days after having sailed from there. The reception I met with at Havre from my friend James Prince, Esquire of Boston, who was more largely interested in the adventure than any other individual excepting myself, was kind and friendly in the extreme, and tended to counteract the effects of my deep mortification, and to raise my spirits for the prosecution of the original plan. He relieved my anxiety relative to the means of defraying the expenses of repairs by engaging to provide them. He gave me a room at his house, and while I was ill there, for this I did not escape, he facilitated my recovery by his care and kindness. With such attentions, my health was soon re-established, my spirits renewed, and I pursued the repairing and refitting the vessel with my accustomed ardor. On examination of the cargo, it was found to be very little damage. The vessel was considerably injured so near the keel that it was necessary to lay her on blocks, where it was discovered that the lower plank was so much broken that several feet of it would require to be replaced with new. This being accomplished, the other repairs made, and the cargo again put on board, there was nothing to prevent proceeding immediately to sea, excepting a difficulty in procuring men which seemed to be insurmountable. No one of my former crew, excepting a black man, George, would try it again. We had arrived at the close of the month of November, and each day's delay by the advance of winter increased the difficulty and danger of our enterprise. Indeed, the westerly gales were already of frequent occurrence. The nights had become long, and when I heard the howling winds and beating rain, and recollected in what a frail boat I had to contend with them, I wish that my destiny had marked out for me a task of less difficult accomplishment. End of Story 3 Biographical Notes Cleveland R.J. was the brother of the great-grandfather of Grover Cleveland. Born in Salem in 1740, died about 1786. When 16 years old, was seized by a press gang in Boston streets and served for several years on board an English frigate under William Trelawney, afterwards Sir William, governor of Jamaica. He was long occupied in the merchant service, and when the revolution broke out, he, with his brig Pilgrim, captured over 50 British prizes. His narrative of voyages and commercial enterprises was not published until 1842, and it was republished at once in England and went through three editions here. Story Four, Part One of Sea Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlock. Sea Stories, edited by Cyrus Townsend Brady. Story 4, Part 1. The Pilot. The hero of Cooper's stirring sea tale is a mysterious pilot known as Mr. Gray, who during the American Revolution came aboard the Yankee frigate Alliance one stormy night to guide her in a privateering expedition along the east coast of England. Captain Munson had been entrusted by the Congress with the dangerous errand of venturing into the enemy's own waters in order to capture prize ships and prisoners of war, who were to be held for exchange. Inspired by the pilot's presence, the daring Yankee Blue Jackets captured the British cutter Alacrity in a sharp contest near the shore. Following this victory, the frigate's officers in council determined upon an invasion of the enemy's country. Accordingly, one night a party of officers and marines from the Alliance, headed by the pilot himself, landed near the Abbey of St. Ruth, and after many exciting adventures and narrow escapes, secured as prisoners Captain Burrowcliffe of the King's Service. Colonel Howard, a wealthy Tory, recently returned from America, and the latter's nieces, Cecilia Howard and Catherine Plowden. Before leaving America, the girls had become engaged to Griffith and Barnstable, young lieutenants on this very frigate, and it was to separate them from their Yankee lovers that Colonel Howard had brought his wards to England, guarding them like prisoners at St. Ruth's. Moreover, Mary, the midshipman on board the Alliance, was the girl's favorite cousin. They therefore willingly accepted the situation, and were not sorry to be transported to the frigate, preparing to enjoy a sea voyage in pleasant company. But the officers knew that reports of the Yankee cruiser must have spread abroad and that pursuit was to be expected. The following pages describes the narrow escape of the Alliance from a British man-of-war. The Escape of the American Frigate Alliance From the Pilot by J. F. Cooper Furious press the hostile squadron. Furious he repels their rage. Loss of blood at length enfeebles. Who can war with thousands wage? Spanish War Song we cannot detain the narrative to detail the scenes which busy wonder, aided by the relation of many marvellous feats produced among the curious seamen who remained in the ship, and their more fortunate fellows who had returned glory from an expedition to the land. For nearly an hour the turbulence of a general movement was heard, issuing from the deep recesses of the frigate, and the boisterous sound of hoarse merriment were listened to by the officers in indulgent silence. But all those symptoms of unbridled humor ceased by the time the morning repast was ended, when the regular sea watch was set, and the greater portion of those whose duty did not require their presence on the vessel's deck availed themselves of the opportunity to repair the loss of sleep sustained in the preceding night still no preparations were made to put the ship in motion though long and earnest consultations which were supposed to relate to their future destiny were observed by the younger officers to be held between their captain the first lieutenant and the mysterious pilot the latter threw many an anxious glance along the eastern horizon searching it minutely with his glass and then would turn his impatient look at the low dense bank of fog which stretching across the ocean like a barrier of cloud entirely intercepted the view towards the south to the north and along the land the air was clear and the sea without spot of any kind 
but in the east a small white sail had been discovered since the opening of day, which was gradually rising above the water, and assuming the appearance of a vessel of some size. Every officer on the quarter-deck in his turn had examined this distant sail, and had ventured an opinion on its destination and character. And even Catherine, who, with her cousin, was enjoying in the open air the novel beauties of the ocean, had been tempted to place her sparkling eye to a glass, to gaze at the stranger. It is a collier, Griffith said, who has hauled from the land in the late gale, and who is luffing up to his course again. If the wind holds here in the south, and he does not get into that fog bank, we can stand off for him and get a supply of fuel before eight bells are struck. I think his head is to the northward, and that he is steering off the wind, returned the pilot, in a musing manner. If that Dillion succeeded in getting his express far enough along the coast, the alarm has been spread, and we must be wary. The convoy of the Baltic trade is in the North Sea. The news of our presence could easily have been taken off to it by some of the cutters that line the coast. I could wish to get the ships as far south as the Helder. Then we lose this weather tide, exclaimed the impatient Griffith. Surely we have the cutter as a lookout. Besides, by beating into the fog, we shall lose the enemy, if enemy it be. And is it thought right for an American frigate to skulk from her foes? The scornful expression that kindled the eye of the pilot, like a gleam of sunshine lighting for an instant some dark dell and laying bare its secrets, was soon lost in the usually quiet look of his glance, though he hesitated, like one who was struggling with his passions, before he answered, If prudence and the service of the states require it, even this proud frigate must retreat and hide from the meanest of her enemies. My advice, Captain Munson, is that you make sail and beat the ship to the windward, as Mr. Griffith has suggested, and that you order the cutter to precede us, keeping more in with the land. The aged seaman, who evidently suspended his orders, only to receive an intimation of the other's pleasure, immediately commanded his youthful assistant to issue the necessary mandates to put these measures in force. Accordingly, the alacrity, which vessel had been left under the command of the junior lieutenant of the frigate, was quickly under way, and making short stretches to the windward, she soon entered the bank of fog and was lost to the eye. In the meantime, the canvas of the ship was loosened and spread leisurely, in order not to disturb the portion of the crew who were sleeping, and, following her little consort, she moved heavily through the water, bearing up against the dull breeze. The quiet of regular duty had succeeded to the bustle of making sail, and, as the ray of the sun fell less obliquely on the distant land, Catherine and Cecilia were amusing Griffith by vain attempts to point out the rounded eminences which they fancy lay in the vicinity of the deserted mansion of St. Ruth. Barnstable, who had resumed his former station in the frigate as her second lieutenant, was pacing the opposite side of the quarter-deck, holding under his arm the speaking trumpet, which denoted that he held the temporary control of the motions of the ship, and inwardly cursing the restraint that kept him from the side of his mistress. At this moment of universal quiet, when nothing above low dialogues interrupted the dashing of the waves as they were thrown lazily aside by the bows of the vessel, the report of a light cannon burst out of the barrier of fog, and then rolled by them on the breeze, apparently vibrating with the rising and sinking of the waters. "'There goes the cutter!' exclaimed Griffith, the instant the sound was heard. "'Surely,' said the captain, "'Summers is not so indiscreet as to scale his guns. 
after the caution he has received. No idle scaling of guns is intended there, said the pilot, straining his eyes to pierce the fog, but soon turning away in disappointment at his inability to succeed. That gun is shotted and has been fired in the hurry of a sudden signal. Can your lookout see nothing, Mr. Barnstable? The lieutenant of the watch hailed the man aloft and demanded if anything were visible in the direction of the wind, and received for answer that the fog intercepted the view in that quarter of the heavens, but that the sail in the east was a ship running large or before the wind. The pilot shook his head doubtingly at this information, but still he manifested a strong reluctance to relinquish the attempt of getting more to the southward. Again he communed with the commander of the frigate, apart from all other ears, and while they yet deliberated, a second report was heard, leaving no doubt that the alacrity was firing signal guns for their particular attention. Perhaps, said Griffith, he wishes to point out his position, or to ascertain ours, believing that we are lost like himself in the mist. We have our compasses, returned the doubting captain. Summers has a meaning in what he says. See, cried Catherine with girlish delight. See, my cousin, see, Barnstable, how beautifully that vapor is wreathing itself in clouds above the smoky line of fog. It stretches already into the very heavens like a lofty pyramid. Barnstable sprang lightly on a gun as he repeated her words. Pyramids of fog and wreathing clouds, by heavens, he shouted, "'Tis a tall ship! Royals, sky sails, and studding sails all abroad. She is within a mile of us and comes down like a racehorse with a spanking breeze, dead before it. Now we know why Summers is speaking in the mist. Ay, cried Griffith and there goes the alacrity, just breaking out of the fog, hovering in for the land. There is a mighty hull under all that cloud of canvas, Captain Munson, said the observant but calm pilot. It is time, gentlemen, to edge away to leeward. What, before we know from whom we run, cried Griffith? My life on it. There is no single ship King George owns, but would tire of the sport before she had played a full game of bowls with. The haughty air of the young man was daunted by the severe look he encountered in the eye of the pilot, and he suddenly ceased, though inwardly chafing with impatient pride. The same eye that detected the canvas above the fog might have seen the flag of a vice-admiral fluttering still nearer the heavens, returned the collected stranger, and England, faulty as she may be, is yet too generous to place a flag officer in time of war in command of a frigate, or a captain in command of a fleet. She knows the value of those who shed their blood in her behalf, and it is thus that she is so well served. Believe me, Captain Munson, there is nothing short of a ship of the line under the symbol of rank, and that broad show of canvas." "'We shall see, sir, we shall see,' returned the old officer, whose manner grew decided, as the danger appeared to thicken. "'Beat to quarters, Mr. Griffith, for we have none but enemies to expect on this coast.' The order was instantly issued, when Griffith remarked with a more temperate zeal, "'If Mr. Gray be right, we shall have reason to thank God that we are so light of heel.' The cry of the strange vessel close abroad the frigate, having already flown down the hatches, the ship was in an uproar at the first tap of the drum. The seamen threw themselves from their hammocks, and lashing them rapidly into long, hard bundles, they rushed to the decks, where they were dexterously stowed in the netting, to aid the defences of the upper part of the vessel. While this tumultuous scene was exhibiting, Griffith gave a secret order to Mary, who disappeared, leading his trembling cousins to a place of safety in the inmost depths of the ship. 
The guns were cleared of their lumber and loosened. The bulkheads were knocked down, and the cabin relieved of its furniture, and the gun deck exhibited one unbroken line of formidable cannon, arranged in all the order of a naval battery ready to engage. Arm chests were thrown open, and the decks strewed with pikes, cutlasses, pistols, and all the various weapons for boarding. In short, the yards were slung, and every other arrangement was made with readiness and dexterity that were actually wonderful. Though all was performed amid an appearance of disorder and confusion that rendered the ship another babel during the continuance of the preparations, in a very few minutes everything was completed, and even the voices of the men ceased to be heard answering to their names as they were mustered at their stations by their respective officers. Gradually the ship became as quiet as the grave, and when even Griffith or his commander found it necessary to speak, their voices were calmer and their tones more mild than usual. The course of the vessel was changed to an oblique line from that in which their enemy was approaching, though the appearance of flight was to be studiously avoided to the last moment. When nothing further remained to be done, every eye became fixed on the enormous pile of swelling canvas that was rising, in cloud over cloud, far above the fog, and which was manifestly moving, like driving vapor, swiftly to the north. Presently the dull, smoky boundary of the mist which rested on the water was pushed aside in vast volumes, and the long tapered spars that projected from the bowsprit of the strange ship issued from the obscurity, and were quickly followed by the whole of the enormous fabric to which they were merely light appendages. For a moment streaks of reluctant vapor clung to the huge floating pile, but they were soon shaken off by the rapid vessel, and the whole of her black hull became distinct to the eye. One, two, three rows of teeth, said Boltroff, deliberately counting the tiers of guns that bristled along the sides of the enemy. A three-decker, John Manley would show his stern to such a fellow, and even the Scotsman would run. Hard up with your helm, quartermaster, cried Captain Munson, there is indeed no time to hesitate with such an enemy within a quarter of a mile. Turn the hands up, Mr. Griffith, and pack on the ships from her trucks to her lower studding sail booms. Be stirring, sir, be stirring. Hard up with your helm. Hard up, sir. The unusual earnestness of their aged commander acted on the startled clue like a voice from the deep and they waited not for the usual signals of the boatswain and the drummer to be given before they broke away from their guns and rushed tumultuously to aid in spreading the desired canvas. There was one minute of ominous confusion that to an inexperienced eye would have foreboded the destruction of all order in the vessel, during which every hand and each tongue seemed in motion, but it ended in opening the immense folds of light duct which were displayed along the whole line of the mass, far beyond the ordinary sails, overshadowing the waters for a great distance on either side of the vessel. During the moment of inaction that succeeded this sudden exertion, the breeze, which had brought up the three-decker, fell fresher on the sails of the frigate, and she started away from her dangerous enemy with a perceptible advantage in point of sailing. The fog rises, cried Griffith. Give us but the wind for an hour, and we shall run her out of gunshot. These nineties are very fast off the wind, returned the captain, in a low tone that was intended only for the ears of his first lieutenant and the pilot, and we shall have a struggle for it. The quick eye of the stranger was glancing over the movements of his enemy while he answered. He finds we have the heels of him already. He is making ready, and we shall be fortunate to escape a broadside. Let her yaw a little, Mr. Griffith. Touch her lightly with the helm. 
if we are raked sir we are lost the captain sprang on the taffrail of his ship with the activity of a younger man and in an instant he perceived the truth of the other's conjecture both vessels now ran for a few minutes keenly watching each other's motions like two skilful combatants the english ship making a slight deviation from the line of her course and then as her movements were anticipated by the other turning as cautiously in the opposite direction until a sudden and wide sweep of her huge bows told the americans plainly on which tack to expect her captain munson made a silent but impressive gesture with his arm as if the crisis were too important for speech which indicated to the watchful griffith the way he wished the frigate sheared to avoid the weight of the impending danger both vessels whirled swiftly up to the wind with their heads towards the land and as the huge black side of the three-decker checkered with its triple batteries frowned full upon her foe it belched forth a flood of fire and smoke accompanied by a bellowing roar that mocked the surly moanings of the sleeping ocean the nerves of the bravest man in the frigate contracted their fibres as the hurricane of iron hurtled by them and each eye appeared to gaze in stupid wonder as if tracing the flight of the swift engines of destruction but the voice of captain munson was heard in the din shouting while he waved his hat earnestly in the required direction meet her meet her with the helm boy meet her mr griffith meet her griffith had so far anticipated this movement as to have already ordered the head of the frigate to be turned in its former course when struck by the unearthly cry of the last tones uttered by his commander he bent his head and beheld the venerable seaman driven through the air his hat still waving his gray hair floating in the wind and his eyes set in the wild look of death great god exclaimed the young man rushing to the side of the ship where he was just in time to see the lifeless body disappear in the waters that were dyed in its blood he has been struck by a shot lower away the boats lower away the jolly boat the barge the tiger the tis useless interrupted the calm deep voice of the pilot he has met a warrior's end and sleeps in a sailor's grave the ship is getting before the wind again and the enemy is keeping his vessel away the youthful lieutenant was recalled by these words to his duty and reluctantly turned his eyes away from the bloody spot on the waters which the busy frigate had already passed to resume the command of the vessel with a forced composure he has cut some of our running gear said the master whose eye had never ceased to dwell on the spars and rigging of the ship and there's a splinter out of the main topmast that is big enough for a fid he has let daylight through some of our canvas too but taking it by and large the squall has gone over and little harm done didn't i hear something said of captain munson getting jammed by a shot he is killed said griffith speaking in a voice that was yet husky with horror he is dead sir and carried overboard there is more need than we forget not ourselves in this crisis dead said boltroff suspending the operation of his active jaws for a moment in surprise and buried in a wet jacket well it is lucky tis no worse for damn if i did not think every stick in the ship would have been cut out of her with this consolatory remark on his lips the master walked slowly forward continuing his orders to repair the damages with a singleness of purpose that rendered him however uncouth as a friend an invaluable man in his station griffith had not yet brought his mind to the calmness that was so essential to discharge duties which had thus suddenly and awfully devolved on him when his elbow was lightly touched by the pilot who had drawn closer to his side 
the enemy appeared satisfied with the experiment said the stranger and as we work the quicker of the two he loses too much ground to repeat it if he be a true seaman and yet he finds we leave him so fast returned griffith he must see that all his hopes rest in cutting us up aloft i dread that he will come by the wind again and lay us under his broadside we should need a quarter of an hour to run without his range if he were anchored he plays a sure game see you not that the vessel we made in the eastern board shows the hull of the frigate tis past a doubt that they are of one squadron and that the expresses have sent them in our wake the english admiral has spread a broad clue mr griffith and as he gathers in his ships he sees that his game has been successful the faculties of griffith had been too much occupied with the hurry of the chase to look at the ocean but startled at the information of the pilot who spoke coolly though like a man sensible of the existence of approaching danger he took the glass from the other and with his own eye examined the different vessels in sight it is certain that the experienced officer whose flag was flying above the light sails of the three-decker saw the critical situation of his chase and reasoned much in the same manner as the pilot or the fearful expedient apprehended by griffith would have been adopted prudence however dictated that he should prevent his enemy from escaping by pressing so closely on his rear as to render it impossible for the american to haul across his bows and run into the open sea between his own vessel and the nearest frigate of his squadron the unpractised reader will be able to comprehend the case better by accompanying the understanding eye of griffith as it glanced from point to point following the whole horizon to the west lay the land along which the alacrity was urging her way industriously with the double purpose of keeping her concert abeam and of avoiding a dangerous proximity to their powerful enemy to the east bearing off the starboard bow of the american frigate was the vessel first seen and which now began to exhibit the hostile appearance of a ship of war steering in a line converging towards themselves and rapidly drawing nigher while far in the northeast was a vessel as yet faintly discerned whose evolutions could not be mistaken by one who understood the movements of nautical warfare we are hemmed in effectually said griffith dropping the glass from his eye and i know not but our wisest course would be to haul in to land and cutting everything light adrift endeavor to pass the broadside of the flagship provided she left a rag of canvas to do it with returned the pilot sir tis an idle hope she would strip your ship in ten minutes to her plank shears had it not been for a lucky wave on which so many of her shots struck and glanced upward we should have nothing to boast of left from the fire she has already given we must stand on and drop the three-decker as far as possible but the frigates said griffith what are we to do with the frigates fight them returned the pilot in a low determined voice fight them young man i have borne the stars and stripes aloft in greater straits than this and even with honour think not that my fortune will desert me now we shall have an hour of desperate battle on that we may calculate but i have lived through whole days of bloodshed you seem not one to quail at the sight of an enemy let me proclaim your name to the men said griffith to a quicken their blood and at such a moment be the host in itself they want it not returned the pilot checking the hasty zeal of the other with his hand i would be unnoticed unless i am known as becomes me i will share your danger but would not rob you of a title of your glory should we come to grapple he continued while a smile of conspicuous pride gleamed across his face 
I will give forth the word as a war cry, and, believe me, these English will quail before it. Griffith submitted to the stranger's will, and, after they had deliberated further on the nature of their evolutions, he gave his attention again to the management of the vessel. The first object which met his eye on turning from the pilot was Colonel Howard, pacing the quarter-deck with a determined brow and a haughty mane, as if already in the enjoyment of that triumph which now seemed certain. "'I fear, sir,' said the young man, approaching him with respect, "'that you will soon find the deck unpleasant and dangerous. Your words are—' "'Mention not the unworthy term.' interrupted the colonel what greater pleasure can there be than to inhale the odor of loyalty that is waved from yonder floating tower of the king and danger you know but little of old george howard young man if you think he would for thousands miss seeing that symbol of rebellion leveled before the flag of his majesty if that be your wish colonel howard returned griffith biting his lip as he looked around at the wondering seamen who were listeners. You will wait in vain, but I pledge you my word that when that time arrives you shall be advised, and that your own hand shall do the ignoble deed. Edward Griffith, why not this moment? This is your moment of probation. Submit to the clemency of the crown, and yield your crew to the royal mercy. In such a case, I would remember the child of my brother Harry's friend, and believe me, my name is known to the ministry, and you, misguided and ignorant abettors of rebellion, cast aside your useless weapons, or prepare to meet the vengeance of yonder powerful and victorious servant of your prince. Fall back, back with ye fellows, cried Griffith fiercely to the men who were gathering around the colonel with looks of sullen vengeance. If a man of you dare approach him, he shall be cast into the sea. The sailors retreated at the order of their commander, but the elated veteran had continued to pace the deck for many minutes before stronger interests diverted the angry glances of the seamen to other objects. End of Story 4, Part 1「the escape of the american frigate alliance from the pilot by j f cooper notwithstanding the ship of the line was slowly sinking beneath the distant waves and in less than an hour from the time she had fired the broadside no more than one of her three tiers of guns was visible from the deck of the frigate she yet presented an irresistible obstacle against retreat to the south on the other hand the ship first seen drew so nigh as to render the glass no longer necessary in watching her movements she proved to be a frigate though one so materially lighter than the american as to have rendered her conquest easy had not her two consorts continued to press on for the scene of battle with such rapidity during the chase the scene had shifted from the point opposite to st ruth to the verge of those shoals where our tale commenced as they approached the latter the smallest of the english ships drew so nigh as to render the combat unavoidable griffith and his crew had not been idle in the intermediate time but all the usual preparations against the casualties of a sea-fight had been duly made. 
When the drum once more called the men to their quarters, and the ship was deliberately stripped of her unnecessary sails, like a prize fighter about to enter the arena, casting aside the encumbrances of dress. At the instant she gave this intimation of her intention to abandon flight and trust the issue to the combat, the nearest English frigate also took in her light canvas in token of her acceptance of the challenge. He is but a little fellow, said Griffith to the pilot, who hovered at his elbow with a sort of fatherly interest in the other's conduct of the battle, though he carries a stout heart. We must crush him at a blow, returned the stranger. Not a shot must be delivered until our yards are locking. I see him training his twelves upon us already. We may soon expect his fire. After standing the brunt of a ninety-gun ship, observed the collected pilot, we shall not shrink from a broadside of a two-and-thirty. Stand to your guns, men, cried Griffith, through his trumpet. Not a shot to be fired without the order. This caution, so necessary to check the ardor of the seamen, was hardly uttered before the enemy became wrapped in sheets of fire and volumes of smoke as gun after gun hurled its iron missiles at their vessel in quick succession. Ten minutes might have passed, the two vessels shearing close to each other every foot they advanced, during which time the crew of the American were compelled, by their commander, to suffer the fire of their adversary without returning a shot. This short period, which seemed an age to the seamen, was distinguished in their vessel by deep silence. Even the wounded and dying, who fell in every part of the ship, stifled their groans under the influence of the severe discipline, which gave a character to every man and each movement of the vessel, and those officers who were required to speak were heard only in the lowest tones of resolute preparation. At length the ship slowly entered the skirts of the smoke that enveloped the enemy, and Griffith hurt the man who stood at the side whisper the word, Now! Let them have it! cried Griffith, in a voice that was heard in the remotest parts of the ship. The shout that burst from the seamen appeared to lift the decks of the vessel, and the affrighted frigate trembled like an aspen with the recoil of her own massive artillery. That shot forth a single sheet of flame, the sailors having disregarded, in their impatience, the usual order of firing. The effect of the broadside on the enemy was still more dreadful, for a death-like silence succeeded to the roar of guns which were only broken by the shrieks and execrations that burst from her, like the moanings of the damned. During the few moments in which the Americans were again loading their cannon, and the English were recovering from their confusion, the vessel of the former moved slowly past her antagonist, and was already doubling across her bows, when the latter was suddenly and, considering the inequality of their forces, it may be added desperately, headed into her enemy. The two frigates grappled. The sudden and furious charge made by the Englishman, as he threw his masses of daring seamen along his bowsprit and out of his channels, had nearly taken Griffith by surprise. But Manuel, who had delivered his first fire with the broadside, now did good service, by ordering his men to beat back the intruders, by a steady and continued discharge. Even the wary pilot lost sight of their other foes, in the high daring of that moment, and smiles of stern pleasure were exchanged between him and Griffith, as both comprehended, at a glance, their advantages. Lash his bowsprits to our mizzenmast, shouted the lieutenant, and we will sweep his deck as he lies. Twenty men sprang eagerly forward to execute the order, among the foremost of whom were Boltroff and the stranger. Aye, now he's our own, cried the busy master, and we will take an owner's liberties with him, and break him up, for by the eternal 
peace, rude man, said the pilot, in a voice of solemn remonstrance. At the next instant you may face your God. Mock not his awful name. The master found time, before he threw himself from the spar on the deck of the frigate again, to cast a look of amazement at his companion who, with a steady mane, but with an eye that lighted with a warrior's ardor, viewed the battle that raged around him like one who marks its progress to control the result. The two frigates grappled. The sight of the Englishman rushing onward with shouts and bitter menaces warmed the blood of Colonel Howard, who pressed to the side of the frigate, and encouraged his friends by his gestures and voice to come on. Away with ye, old croaker, cried the master, seizing him by the collar. Away with ye to the hold, or I'll order you fired from a gun. Down with your arms, rebellious dog, shouted the colonel, carried beyond himself by the ardor of the fray. Down to the dust, and implore the mercy of your injured prince. Invigorated by a momentary glow, the veteran grappled with his brawny antagonist, but the issue of the short struggle was yet suspended when the English, driven back by the fire of the marines and the menacing front that Griffith with his boarders presented, retreated to the forecastle of their own ship and attempted to return the deadly blows they were receiving in their hull from the cannon that barnstable directed a solitary gun was all they could bring to bear on the americans but this loaded with canister was fired so near as to send its glaring flame into the very faces of their enemies the struggling colonel who was already sinking beneath the arm of his foe felt the rough grasp loosen from his throat at the flash and the two combatants sunk powerless on their knees facing each other. How now, brother? exclaimed Boltroff with a smile of grim fierceness. Some of that grist has gone to your mill. Ha! No answer could, however, be given before the yielding forms of both fell to the deck, where they lay helpless amid the din of the battle and the wild confusion of the eager combatants notwithstanding the furious struggle they had witnessed the elements did not cease their functions and urged by the breeze and lifted irresistibly on a wave the american ship was forced through the water still farther across the bows of her enemy the idle fastenings of hemp and iron were snapped asunder like strings of tow and Griffith saw his own ship borne away from the Englishman at the instant that the bowsprit of the latter was torn from its lashings and tumbled into the sea, followed by spar after spar, until nothing of all her proud tackling was remaining, but the few parted and useless ropes that were left dangling along the stumps of her lower masts. As his own stately vessel moved from the confusion she had caused and left the dense cloud of smoke in which her helpless antagonist lay, the eye of the young man glanced anxiously toward the horizon, where he now remembered he had more foes to contend against. We have shaken off the thirty-two most happily, he said to the pilot, who followed his motions with singular interest but here is another fellow shearing in for us, who shows as many ports as ourselves, and who appears inclined for a closer interview. Besides, the hull of the ninety is rising again, and I fear that she will be down but too soon. We must keep the use of our braces and sails, returned the pilot, and on no account close with the other frigate. We must play a double game, sir, and fight this new adversary with our heels as well as with our guns. Tis time then that we were busy, for he is shortening sail, and as he nears so fast we must expect to hear from him every minute. What do you propose, sir? Let him gather in his canvas, returned the pilot, and when he thinks himself snug, 
we can throw out a hundred men at once upon our yards and spread everything alow and aloft we may then draw ahead of him by surprise if we can once get him in our wake i have no fears of dropping them all a stern chase is a long chase cried griffith and the thing may do clear up the decks here and carry down the wounded and as we have our hands full the poor fellows who have done with us must go overboard at once this melancholy duty was instantly attended to while the young seaman who commanded the frigate returned to his duty with the absorbed air of one who felt his high responsibility these occupations however did not prevent his hearing the sound of barnstable's voice calling eagerly to young mary bending his head towards the sound griffith beheld his friend looking anxiously up the main hatch with a face grimed with smoke his coat off and his shirt bespattered with human blood tell me boy he said is mr griffith untouched they say that a shot came in upon the quarter-deck that tripped up the heels of a half a dozen before mary could answer the eyes of barnstable which even while he spoke were scanning the state of the vessel's rigging encountered the kind looks of griffith and from that moment perfect harmony was restored between the friends ah you are here griff and with a whole skin i see cried barnstable smiling with pleasure they have passed poor boltrop down into one of his own storerooms if that fellow's bowsprit had held on ten minutes longer what a mark i should have made on his face and eyes tis perhaps best as it is returned griffith but what have ye done with those whom we are most bound to protect barnstable made a significant gesture towards the depth of the vessel as he answered on the cables safe as wood iron and water can keep them though catherine has had her head up three times too a summons from the pilot drew griffith away and the young officers were compelled to forget their individual feelings in the pressing duties of their stations the ship which the american frigate had now to oppose was a vessel of near her own size and equipage and when griffith looked at her again he perceived that she had made her preparations to assert her equality in manful fight her sails had been gradually reduced to the usual quantity and by certain movements on her deck the lieutenant and his constant attendant the pilot well understood that she only wanted to lessen her distance a few hundred yards to begin the action now spread everything whispered the stranger griffith applied the trumpet to his mouth and shouted in a voice that was carried even to the enemy let fall out with your booms sheet home hoist away of everything the inspiring cry was answered by a universal bustle fifty men flew out on the dizzy heights of the different spars while broad sheets of canvas rose as suddenly along the mast as if some mighty bird were spreading its wings the englishman instantly perceived his mistake and he answered the artifice by a roar of artillery griffith watched the effects of the broadside with an absorbing interest as the shot whistled above his head but when he perceived his masts untouched and the few unimportant ropes only that were cut he replied to the uproar with a burst of pleasure a few men were however seen clinging with wild frenzy to the cordage dropping from rope to rope like wounded birds fluttering through a tree until they fell heavily into the ocean the sullen ship sweeping by them in cold indifference at the next instance the spars and masts of their enemy exhibited a display of men similar to their own when griffith again placed the trumpet to his mouth and shouted aloud give it to them drive them from their yards boys scatter them with your grape unreave their rigging the crew of the american wanted but little encouragement to enter on this experiment with hearty good will 
and the close of his cheering words were uttered amid the deafening roar of his own cannon. The pilot had, however, mistaken the skill and readiness of their foe, for, notwithstanding the disadvantageous circumstances under which the Englishman increased his sail, the duty was steadily and dexterously performed. The two ships were now running rapidly on parallel lines, hurling at each other their instruments of destruction with furious industry and with severe and certain loss to both though with no manifest advantage in favor of either both griffith and the pilot witnessed with deep concern this unexpected defeat of their hopes for they could not conceal from themselves that each moment lessened their velocity through the water as the shot of their enemy stripped the canvas from the yards or dashed aside the lighter spars in their terrible progress. We find our equal here, said Griffith to the stranger. The ninety is heaving up again like a mountain, and if we continue to shorten sail at this rate, she will soon be down upon us. You say true, sir, returned the pilot, musing. The man shows judgment as well as spirit, but— he was interrupted by Mary, who rushed from the forward part of the vessel, his whole face betokening the eagerness of his spirit and the importance of his intelligence. The breakers, he cried, when nigh enough to be heard amid the din. We are running dead on a ripple, and the sea is white, not two hundred yards ahead. The pilot jumped on a gun, and bending to catch a glimpse through the smoke, he shouted, in those clear piercing tones that could be even heard among the roaring of the cannon port port your helm we are on the devil's grip pass up the trumpet sir port your helm fellow give it to them boys give it to the proud english dogs griffith unhesitatingly relinquished the symbol of his rank fastening his own firm look on the calm but quick eye of the pilot and gathering assurance from the high confidence he read in the countenance of the stranger the seamen were too busy with their cannon and their rigging to regard the new danger and the frigate entered one of the dangerous passes of the shoals in the heat of a severely contested battle the wondering looks of a few of the older sailors glanced at the sheets of foam that flew by them in doubt whether the wild gambols of the waves were occasioned by the shot of the enemy, when suddenly the noise of cannon was succeeded by the sullen wash of the disturbed element, and presently the vessel glided out of her smoky shroud and was boldly steering in the center of the narrow passages. For ten breathless minutes longer the pilot continued to hold an uninterrupted sway, during which the vessel ran swiftly by ripples and breakers, by streaks of foam and darker passages of deep water, when he threw down his trumpet and exclaimed, What threatened to be our destruction has proved our salvation. Keep yonder hill crowned with wood, one point open from the church tower at its base, and steer east by north. You will run through these shoals on that course in an hour, and by so doing you will gain five leagues of your enemy, who will have to double their tail. The Alliance and the English 32 The moment he stepped from the gun, the pilot lost the air of authority that had so singularly distinguished his animated form, and even the close interest he had manifested in the incidents of the day became lost in the cold, settled reserve he had affected during his intercourse with his present associates every officer in the ship after the breathless suspense of uncertainty had passed rushed to those places where a view might be taken of their enemies the ninety was still steering boldly onward and had already approached the two and thirty which lay a helpless wreck rolling on the unruly seas that were rudely tossing her on their wanton billows the frigate last engaged was running along the edge of the ripple with her torn sails flying loosely in the air 
her ragged spars tottering in the breeze, and everything above her hull exhibiting the confusion of a sudden and unlooked-for check to her progress. The exulting taunts and mirthful congratulation of the seamen as they gazed at the English ships were, however, soon forgotten in the attention that was required to their own vessel. The drums beat the retreat, the guns were lashed, the wounded again removed, and every individual able to keep the deck was required to lend his assistance in repairing the damages of the frigate and securing her masts. The promised hour carried the ship safely through all the dangers, which were much lessened by daylight, and by the time the sun had begun to fall over the land, Griffith, who had not quitted the deck during the day, beheld his vessel once more cleared of the confusion of the chase and battle, and ready to meet another foe. At this period he was summoned to the cabin, at the request of the ship's chaplain delivering the charge of the frigate to Barnstable, who had been his active assistant, no less in their subsequent labors than in the combat. He hastily divested himself of the vestiges of the fight, and proceeded to obey the repeated and earnest call. End of Story 4 Part 2 Biographical Notes Cooper, J. F., born in New Jersey, 1789, died 1851. He followed the sea for five years after three years at Yale. His first novel, Precaution, was published when he was 30. His chief books are The Spy, The Pilot, The Last of the Mohicans, The Prairie, Red Rover, The Bravo, The Pathfinder, The Deerslayer, The Two Admirals, wing and wing and satin stow all of them either sea tales or tales of frontier life story five of sea stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john van stan savannah georgia sea stories edited by cyrus townsend brady story five among the ice flows from the sea lions by j fenimore cooper keep her a good fool mr hazard said roswell as he was leaving the deck to take the first sleep in which he had indulged for four and twenty hours and let her go through the water we are behind our time and must keep in motion Give me a call if anything like ice appears in a serious way. Hazard I eyed this order as usual, buttoned his pea-jacket tighter than ever, and saw his young superior. The transcendental delicacy of the day is causing the difference in rank to be termed senior and junior. But Hazard saw his superior go below with a feeling allied to envy, so heavy were his eyelids with the want of rest. Stimson was in the first mate's watch, and the latter approached that old sea-dog with a wish to keep himself awake by conversing. "'You seem as wide awake, King Stephen,' the mate remarked, "'as if you never felt drowsy.' "'This is not a part of the world for hammocks and berths, Mr. Hazard,' was the reply. "'I can get along and must get along with a quarter part of the sleep in these seas as would serve me in a low latitude. "'And I feel as if I wanted all I can get.' Them fellows look up well into our wake, Stephen. They do indeed, sir, and they ought to do it, for we have been longer than is for our good in Vern. Well, now we have got a fresh start. I hope we may make a clear run of it. I saw no ice worth speaking of to the Nord here, before we made sail. Because you'd seed none, Mr. Hazard, is no proof there is none. Flow ice can't be seen at any great distance, though it's blink may. But it seems to me it's all blink in these here seas. There, you're quite right, Stephen, for turn which way you will, the horizon has a show of that sort. Starboard! called out the lookout forward. Keep her away! Keep her away! There is ice ahead! Ice in here! exclaimed Hazard, springing forward. That is more than we bargained for. Where away is your ice, Smith? Off here, sir, on our weather bow, and a mortal big field of it. Just sitch and chap as nipped the vineyard lion when she first came in to join us. 
such a fellow as that would take the sap out of our bends as a squeezer takes the juice from a lemon smith was a carpenter by trade which was probably the reason why he introduced this figure hazard saw the ice with regret for he had hoped to work the schooner fairly out to sea in his watch but the field was getting down through the passage in a way that threatened to cut off the exit of the two schooners from the bay daggett kept close in his wake a proof that this experienced navigator in such waters saw no means to turn farther to windward as the wind was now abeam both vessels drove rapidly ahead and in half an hour the northern point of the land they had so lately left came into view close aboard of them just then the moon rose and objects became more clearly visible hazard hailed the vineyard line and demanded what was to be done it was possible by hauling close on a wind to pass the cape a short distance to windward of it and seemingly thus clear the flow unless this were done both vessels would be compelled to wear and run for the southern passage which would carry them many miles to leeward and might place them a long distance on the wrong side of the group is captain garner on deck asked daggett who now had drawn close up on the lee quarter of his consort hazard having brailed his foresail and laid his topsail sharp aback to enable him to do so if he isn't i'd advise you to give him a call at once this was done immediately, and while it was doing, the vineyard lion swept past the oyster-pond schooner. Roswell announced his presence on the deck just as the other vessel cleared his bows. "'There's no time to consult, Garner,' answered Daggett. "'There's our road before us. Go through it we must, or stay where we are until that field ice gives us a jam down yonder in the crescent. I will lead, and you can follow as soon as your eyes are open.' One glance let Roswell into the secret of his situation. He liked it little, but he did not hesitate. Fill the topsail and haul aft the foresheet, were the quiet orders that proclaimed what he intended to do. Both vessels stood on. By some secret process, every man on board the two crafts became aware of what was going on, and appeared on deck. All hands were not called, nor was there any particular noise to attract attention, but the word had been whispered below that there was a great risk to run. A risk it was, of a verity it was necessary to stand close along that iron-bound coast where the seals had so lately resorted for a distance of several miles the wind would not admit of the schooner steering much more than a cable's length from the rock for quite a league after which the shore tended to the southward and a little sea-room would be gained but on those rocks the waves were then beating heavily and their bellowings as they rolled into the cavities were at almost all times terrific there was some relief however in the knowledge obtained of the shore by having frequently passed up and down it in the boats it was known that the water was deep close to the visible rocks and that there was no danger as long as a vessel could keep off them no one spoke every eye was strained to discern objects ahead or was looking astern to trace the expected collision between the flow ice and the low promontory of the cape the ear soon gave notice that this meeting had already taken place, for the frightful sound that attended the cracking and rending of the field might have been heard fully a league. Now it was that each schooner did her best, yards were braced up, sheets flattened, and the helm tended. The close proximity of the rocks on the one side, and the secret presentiment of there being more field ice on the other, kept every one wide awake. The two masters, in particular, were all eyes and ears. It was getting to be very cold, and the sort of shelter aloft that goes by the queer name of crow's nest had been fitted up in each vessel. A mate was now sent into each to ascertain what might be discovered to windward. Almost at the same time these young seamen hailed their respective decks, and gave notice that a wide field was coming in upon them, and must eventually crush them unless avoided. This startling intelligence reached the two commanders in the very same moment. The emergency demanded decision, and each man acted for himself. Roswell ordered his helm put down and his schooner tacked. The water was not rough enough to prevent the success of the maneuver. On the other hand, Daggett kept a rap fool and stood on. Roswell manifested the more judgment and seamanship. He was now far enough away from the cape to beat to windward, and by going nearer to the enemy he might always run along its southern boundary, profit by any opening and would be by as much as he could thus gain to windward of the coast. Daggett had one advantage. By standing on in the event of a return becoming necessary, he could gain in time. 
In ten minutes the two schooners were a mile asunder. We shall first follow that of Roswell Gardiner's in his attempt to escape. The first flow, which was ripping and tearing one of its angles into fragments as it came grinding down on the cape, soon compelled the vessel to tack. Making short reaches, Roswell ere long found himself fully a mile to windward of the rocks, and sufficiently near to the new flow to discern its shape, drift, and general character. Its eastern end had lodged upon the field that first came in, and was adding to the first momentum with which that enormous flow was pressing down upon the cape. Large as was that first visitor to the bay, this was of at least twice if not thrice its dimensions. What gave Roswell the most concern was the great distance that this field extended to the westward. He went up into the crow's nest himself, and aided by the light of a most brilliant moon and a sky without a cloud, he could perceive the blink of ice in that direction, as he fancied, for fully two leagues. What was unusual, perhaps, at that early season of the year, these flows did not consist of a vast collection of numberless cakes of ice but the whole field so far as could then be ascertained was firm and united the nights were now so cold that ice made fast wherever there was water and it occurred to our young master that possibly fragments that had once been separated and broken by the waves might have become reunited by the agency of the frost roswell descended from the crow's nest half chilled by the cutting wind though it blew from a warm quarter summoning his mates he asked their advice it seems to me, Captain Gardner, Hazard replied, there's very little choice. Here we are, so far as I can make it out, embayed, and we have only to box about until daylight comes when some chance may turn up to help us. If so, we must turn it to account. If not, we must make up our minds to winter here. This was coolly and calmly said, though it was clear enough that Hazard was quite in earnest. You forget, there may be an open passage to the westward, Mr. Hazard roswell rejoined and that we may yet pass out to sea by it captain daggett is already out of sight in the western board and we may do well to stand on after him aye aye sir i know all that captain garner and it may be as you say but when i was aloft half an hour since if there wasn't the blink of ice in that direction quite round to the back of the island there wasn't the blink of ice nowhere hereabouts i'm used to the sight of it and can't well be mistaken there is always ice on that side of the land, Hazard, and you may have seen the blink of the bergs which have hugged the cliffs in the quarter all summer. Still, that is not proving we shall find no outlet. This craft can go through a very small passage, and we must take care and find one in proper time. Wintering here is out of the question. A hundred reasons tell us not to think of such a thing besides the interests of our owners. We are walking along this flow pretty fast, though I think the vessel is too much by the head. Don't it strike you so, Hazard? Lord, sir, it's nothing but the ice that has made, and is making for it. Before we got so near the field as to find a better lee, the little nipper that came athwart our bows froze almost as soon as it wet us. I do suppose, sir, there are now several tons of ice on our bows, counting from channel to channel forward. On examination this proved to be true and the knowledge of the circumstance did not at all contribute to gardiner's feeling of security he saw there was no time to be lost and he crowded sail with a view of forcing the vessel past the dangers if possible and of getting her into a milder climate but even a fast sailing schooner will scarcely equal our wishes under such circumstances there was no doubt that the sea lion's speed was getting to be affected by the manner in which her bows were weighed down by ice in addition to the discomfort produced by cold, damp, and the presence of a slippery substance on the deck and rigging. Fortunately, there was not much spray flying, or matters would have been much worse. As it was, they were bad enough and very ominous of future evil. While the sea lion of Oyster Pond was running along the margin of the sea ice in the manner just described, and after the blink to the westward had changed to a visible field, making it very uncertain whether any egress was to be found in that quarter or not, an opening suddenly appeared trending to the northward and sufficiently wide, as Roswell thought, to enable him to beat through it. Putting his helm down, his schooner came heavily round and was filled on a course that soon carried her half a mile into this passage. At first everything seemed propitious, the channel rather opening than otherwise, while the course was such north-northwest, 
as enabled the vessel to make very long legs on one tack, and that the best. After going about four or five times, however, all these flattering symptoms suddenly changed by the passage terminating in a cul-de-sac. Almost at the same time, the ice closed rapidly in the schooner's wake. An effort was made to run back, but it failed in consequence of an enormous flow's turning on its center, having met resistance from a field closer in, that was in its turn stopped by the rocks. Roswell saw at once that nothing could be done at the moment. He took in all his canvas, as well as the frozen cloth could be handled, got out ice anchors and hauled his vessel into a species of cove, where there would be the least danger of a nip should the fields continue to close. All this time Daggett was as busy as a bee. He rounded the headland and flattered himself that he was about to slip past all the rocks and get out into the open water, when the vast fields of which the blink had been seen even by those in the other vessel suddenly stretched themselves across his course in a way that set at defiance all attempts to go any further in that direction. Daggett wore round and endeavored to return. This was by no means as easy as it was to go down before the wind, and his bowels were as much encumbered with ice, more so indeed than those of the other schooner. Once or twice his craft missed stays in consequence of getting so much by the head, and it was deemed necessary to heave to and take to the axes. A great deal of extra and cumbrous weight was gotten rid of, but an hour of most precious time was lost. By the time Daggett was ready to make sail again, he found his return round the headland was entirely cut off by the fields having come in absolute contact with the rocks. It was now midnight, and the men on board both vessels required rest. A watch was set in each, and most of the people were permitted to turn in. Of course, proper lookouts were had, but the light of the moon was not sufficiently distinct to render it safe to make any final efforts under its favor. No great alarm was felt, there being nothing unusual in a vessel's being embayed in the ice, and so long as she was not nipped or pressed upon by actual contact, the position was thought safe rather than the reverse. It was desirable, moreover, for the schooners to communicate with each other, for some advantage might be known to one of the masters that was concealed by the distance from his companion. Without concert, therefore, Roswell and Daggett came to the same conclusions and waited patiently. The day came at last, cold and dreary, though not altogether without the relief of an air that blew from regions far warmer than the ocean over which it was now traveling. Then the two schooners became visible from each other, and Roswell saw the jeopardy of Daggett, and Daggett saw the jeopardy of Roswell. The vessels were little more than a mile apart, but the situation of the vineyard lion was much the more critical. She had made fast to the flow, but her support itself was in a steady and most imposing motion. As soon as Roswell saw the manner in which his consort was surrounded, and the very threatening aspect of the danger that pressed upon him, his first impulse was to hasten to him, with a party of his own people, to offer any assistance he could give. After looking at the ice immediately around his own craft, where all seemed to be right, he called over the names of six of his men, ordered them to eat a warm breakfast and to prepare to accompany him. In twenty minutes Roswell was leading his little party across the ice, each man carrying an axe, or some other implement that it was supposed might be of use. It was by no means difficult to proceed, for the surface of the flow, one seemingly more than a league in extent, was quite smooth and the snow on it was crusted to a strength that would have borne a team. The water between the ice and the rocks is a much narrower strip than I had thought," said Roswell to his constant attendant, Stimson. Here it does not appear to be a hundred yards in width. Nor is it, sir. Whew! This trotting in so cold a climate makes a man puff like a whale blowing. But Cap'n Garner, that schooner will be cut in two before we can get to her. Look, sir, the flow has reached the rocks already, quite near her, and it does not stop the drift at all, seemingly. Roswell made no reply. The state of the vineyard lion did appear to be much more critical than he had previously imagined. Until he came nearer to the land, he had formed no notion of the steady power with which the field was setting down on the rocks, on which the broken fragments were now creeping like creatures endowed with life. Occasionally there would be loud disruptions, and the movement of the flow would become more rapid, 
Then again a sort of pause would succeed, and for a moment the approaching party felt a gleam of hope. But all expectations of this sort were doomed to be disappointed. "'Look, sir!' exclaimed Stimson. "'She went down a four at twenty fathoms at that one set. She must be awful near the rocks, sir.' All the men now stopped. They knew they were powerless. An intense anxiety rendered them averse to move. Attention appeared to interfere with their walking on the ice, and each held his breath in expectation. They saw that the schooner, then less than a cable's length from them, was close to the rocks, and the next shock, if anything like the last, must overwhelm her. To their astonishment, instead of being nipped, the schooner rose by a stately movement that was not without grandeur. Upheld by broken cakes that had got beneath her bottom and fairly reached the shelf of rocks almost unharmed, not a man had left her, but there she was, placed on the shore some twenty feet above the surface of the sea on rocks worn smooth by the action of the waves. Had the season been propitious, and did the injury stop here, it might have been possible to get the craft into the water again and still carry her to America. But the flow was not yet arrested. Cake succeeded cake, one riding another, until a wall of ice rose along the shore that Roswell and his companions, with all their activity and courage, had great difficulty in crossing. They succeeded in getting over it, however, but when they reached the unfortunate schooner, she was literally buried. The masts were broken, the sails torn, rigging scattered, and sides stove. The sea lion of Martha's vineyard was a worthless wreck worthless as to all purposes but that of being converted into materials for a smaller craft or to be used as fuel all this had been done in ten minutes then it was that the vast superiority of nature over the resources of man made itself apparent the people of the two vessels stood aghast with this sad picture of their own insignificance before their eyes the crew of the wreck it is true had escaped without difficulty the movement having been as slow and steady as it was irresistible. But there were, in the clothes they had on, with all their effects, buried under piles of ice that were already thirty or forty feet in height. "'She looks as if she was built there, Garner,' Daggett coolly observed as he stood, regarding the scene with eyes as intently riveted on the wreck as human organs were ever fixed on any object. "'Had a man told me this could happen, I would not have believed him.' Had she been a three-decker, this ice would have treated her in the same way. There is a force in such a field that walls of stone could not withstand. Captain Garner, Captain Garner, called out Stimson hastily. We'd better go back, sir. Our own craft is in danger. She is drifting fast in toward the Cape, and may reach it afore we can get to her. Sure enough it was so. In one of the changes that are so unaccountable among the ice, the flow had taken a sudden and powerful direction towards the entrance of the great bay. It was probably owing to the circumstance that the inner field had forced its way past the cape, and made room for its neighbor to follow. A few of Daggett's people, with Daggett himself, remained to see what might yet be saved from the wreck, but all the rest of the men started for the cape, towards which the oyster-pond craft was now directly setting. The distance was less than a league, and as yet there was not much snow on the rocks. By taking an upper shelf it was possible to make pretty good progress, and such was the manner of Roswell's present march. It was an extraordinary sight to see the coast along which our party was hastening. Just at that moment, as the cakes of ice were broken from the field, they were driven upward by the vast pressure from without, and the whole line of the shore seemed as if alive with creatures that were issuing from the ocean to clamber on the rocks. Roswell had often seen that very coast peopled with seals, as it now appeared to be in activity with fragments of ice, that were writhing and turning and rising one upon another as if possessed by the vital principle. In half an hour Roswell and his party reached the house. The schooner was then less than half a mile from the spot, still setting in, along with the outer field, but not nipped. So far from being in danger of such a calamity, the little basin in which she lay had expanded instead of closing, and it would have been possible to handle a quick working craft in it, under her canvas. An exit, however, was quite out of the question, there being no sign of any passage to or from that icy dock. There the craft still lay, anchored to the weather flow. 
while the portion of her crew which remained on board was as anxiously watching the coast as those who were on the coast watched her at first roswell gave his schooner up but on closer examination found reason to hope that she might pass the rocks and enter the inner rather than the great bay end of story five recording by john van stan savannah georgia story six of sea stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Reading done by Jules Harlech. Sea Stories, edited by Cyrus Townsend Brady. Story 6. A Tornado at Sea. From the Green Hand, by George Couples. What was my horror when I saw the quicksilver had sunk so far below the mark, probably fixed there that morning, as to be almost shrunk in the ball whatever the merchant service might know about the instrument in those days the african coast was the place to teach its right use to us in the old iris i laid down my knife and fork as carelessly as i could and went straight on deck here i sought out the mate who was forward watching the land and at once took him aside to tell him the fact well sir said he coolly and what of that a sign of wind certainly before very long but in the meantime we're sure to have it off the land that's one of the very reasons said i for thinking this will be from seaward since towards evening the land will have plenty of air without it but more than that sir said i i tell you mr finch i know the west coast of africa pretty well and so far south as this, the glass falling so low as twenty-seven, is always the sign of a northwesterly blow. If you're a wise man, sir, you'll not only get your upper spars down on deck, but you'll see your anchors clear. Finch plainly got furious at my meddling again, and said he, Instead of that, sir, I shall hold on everything aloft, to stand out when i get the breeze do you really think then said i pointing to the farthest off streak of land trending away by this time astern of us faint as it was do you think you could ever wither that point with anything like a strong nor'wester besides a current heading you in as you got fair hold of it again perhaps not said he wincing a little as he glanced at it but you happen always to suppose what there's a thousand to one against sir why sir you might as well take command at once if it did come to that i'd rather i'd rather see the ship lost i'd rather go to the bottom with all in her after handling her as i know well how than i'd see the chance given to you the young fellow fairly shouted this last word into my very ear he was in a regular furious passion you'd better let me alone that's all i've got to say to you sir growled he as he turned away so i thought it no use to say more and leaned over the bulwarks resolved to see it out the fact was the farther we got off the land now the worst seeing that if what i dreaded should prove true why we were probably in th thirty or forty fathoms of water where no anchor could hold for ten minutes time if it ever caught ground my way would have been to get every boat out at once and tow until you could see the color of some shoal or other from aloft then take my chance there to ride out whatever might come to the last cable aboard of us accordingly i wasn't sorry to see that by this time the whole bight of the coast was slowly rising off our beam betwixt the high land far astern and the broad bluffs upon her starboard bow which last came out already of a sandy reddish tint 
and the lower part a clear blue, as the sun got westward on our other side. What struck me was that the face of the water, which was all over wrinkles and winding lines, where here and there a quick ripple, when I went below, had got on a sudden quite smooth as far as you could see, as if they had sunk down like so many eels, a long uneasy groundswell was beginning to heave in from seaward, on which the ship rose, once or twice I fancied I could observe the colour different away towards the land, like the muddy chocolate spreading out near a river mouth at ebb tide. Then again it was green, rather, and as for the look of the coast, I had no knowledge of it. I thought again, certainly, of the old quartermaster's account in the iris, but there was neither anything like to be seen, nor any sign of a break in the coast at all, though high headlands enough. The ship might have been about twelve or fourteen miles from the northeast point upon her starboard bow a high rocky range of bluffs, and rather less from the nearest of what lay away off her beam. But after this you could mark nothing more, except it were that she edged farther from the point, by the way its bearings shifted or got blurred together. Either she stood still, or she caught some eddy or underdrift, and the mate walked about quite lively once more. The matter was how to breathe, or bear your clothes, when all of a sudden I heard the second mate sing out from the forecastle. Stand by the braces there. Look out for the top's halyards. He came shuffling aft the next moment as fast as his foundered old shanks could carry him, and told Mr. Finch there was a squall coming off the land. The mate sprang up on the bulwarks, and so did I catching a glance from him as much as to say, there's your gale from seaward, you pretentious lubber. The lowest streak of coast bore at present before our starboard quarter, betwixt east and southeastard, with some pretty high land running away up from it, and a sort of dim blue haze hanging beyond, as twere. Just as McLeod spoke, I could see a dusky dark vapor thickening and spreading in the haze, till it rose black along the flat, out of the sky behind it, whitened and then darkened again, like a heavy smoke floating up into the air. All was confusion on deck for a minute or two. Off went all the awnings, and every hand was ready at his station, fisting the ropes, when I looked again at the cloud and then at the mates. By George, said I, noticing a pale wreath of it curling up on the pale clear sky above it, as to a puff of air, it is smoke, some niggers as they often do, burning the bush. So it was, and soon, as Finch gave in, all hands quietly coiled up the ropes. It was scarce five minutes after that Jacob's, who was coiling up a rope beside me, gave me a quiet touch with one finger. Mr. Collins, sir, said he, in a low voice, looking almost right up high over the, towards the ship's larboard bow, which he couldn't have done before, for the awning so lately above us. Look, sir, there's an ox eye. I followed his gaze, but it wasn't for a few seconds that I found what it pointed to. In the hot, far-off, like blue dimness of the sky overhead, compared with the white glare of which to westward our canvas aloft was but dirty gray and yellow. Twas what none but a seaman would have observed, and many a seaman wouldn't have done so. But a man of war's man is used to look out at all hours, in all latitudes, and to a man that knew its meaning, this would have been no joke, even out of the sight of land, as it was, the thing gave me a perfect thrill of dread. High aloft in the heavens northward, where there were freest from the sun, now standing over the open horizon amidst a wide bright pool of light, you managed to discern a small silvery speck, growing slowly as it were, 
out of the faint blue hollow, like a star in the daytime, till you felt as if it looked at you, from God knows what distance away. One eye after another amongst the mates and crew joined Jacob's and mine, with the same sort of dumb fellowship to be seen when a man in London streets watches the top of a steeple. And however hard to make out at first, ere long none of them could miss seeing it, as it got slowly larger, sinking by degrees, till the sky closed about it, seemed to thicken like a dusky ring around the white. And the sunlight upon our seaward quarter blazed out doubly strong, as if it came dazzling out of a brass bell, with the bright tongue swinging in it far off to one side, where the hush made you think of a stroke back upon us, with some terrible sound to boot. The glassy water by this time was beginning to rise under the ship, with a struggling kind of unequal heave, as if a giant you couldn't see kept shoving it down here and there with both hands, and it came swelling up elsewhere, to northwestward or thereabouts, betwixt the sun and this ill-boding token aloft, the far line of open sea still lay shining motionless and smooth. Next time you looked, it had got even brighter than before, seeming to leave the horizon visibly. Then the streak of air just above it had grown gray, and a long hedge of hazy vapor was creeping as it were up over from beyond. The white speck all the while traveling down towards it slantwise from Nordard, and spreading the dark ring slowly out into the circle of cloud, till the keen eye of it at last sank in, and below, as well as aloft, the whole northwestern quarter got blurred together in one gloomy mass. If there was a question at first whether the wind mightn't come from so far nord as to give her a chance of running out to sea before it, there was none now. Our sole recourse lay either in getting nearer the land meanwhile, to let go anchor ere it came on, with her head to it, or we might make a desperate trial to weather the lee point now far astern. The fact was, we were going to have a regular tornado, and that of the worst kind, which wouldn't soon blow itself out, though near an hour's notice would probably pass ere it was on. The three mates laid their heads gravely together over the capstan for a minute or two, after which Finch seemed to perceive that the first of the two ways was the safer, though of course the nearer we should get to the land, the less chance there was of clearing it afterwards, should her cables part or the anchors drag. The two boats still alongside and two others dropped from the davits were manned at once and set to towing the India man ahead in shore, while the bower and sheet anchors were got out to the cat heads ready for letting go, cables overhauled, ranged, and clinched as quickly as possible, and the deep sea lead passed along to take soundings every few minutes. On we crept, slow as death, and almost as still, except the jerk of the oars from the heaving waters at her bows, and the loud flap of the big topsails now and then, everything aloft save them and the brailed foresail being already closed furled, the clouds all the while rising along our larboard beam nor'west and north, over the grey bank on the horizon, till once more you could scarce say which point the wind would come from, unless by the huge purple heap of vapor in the midst. The sun had got low, and he shivered his dazzling spokes of light beyond one edge of it, as if it twere a mountain you saw over some coast or other. Indeed, you'd have thought the ship almost shut in by land on both sides of her, which was what seemed to terrify the passengers most, as they gathered above the poop stairs and watched it, which was the true land and which the clouds, t'was hard to say, 
and the sea gloomed writhing between them like a huge lake in the mountains i saw sir charles hyde walk out of the round house and in again glancing uneasily about his daughter was standing with another young lady gazing at the land and at the sight of her sweet curious face i'd have given worlds to be able to do something that might save it from the chance possibly of being that very night dashed among the breakers on the lee shore in the dark or at best suppose the almighty favoured any one of us so far perhaps landed in the wilds of africa had there been aught man could do more why though i never should get a smile for it i'd have compassed it mate or no mate but all was done that could be done and i had nothing to say westwood came near her too apparently seeing our bad case at last to some extent and both trying to break it to her and to assure her mind so i folded my arms again and kept my eyes fixed hard upon the bank of cloud as some new weather mark stole out of it and the sea stretched breathlessly away below like new melted lead the air was like to choke you or rather there was none as if water sky and everything else wanted life and one would fain have caught the first rush of the tornado into his mouth the men emptying the dipper on deck from the cask from sheer loathing as for the land it seemed to draw nearer of itself till every point and wrinkle in the headland off our bow came out in a red coppery gleam one saw the white line of surf round it and some blue country beyond like indigo then back it darkened again and all aloft was getting livid like over the bare royal mastheads suddenly a fair air was felt to flutter from landward it half lifted the top sails and a heavy earthly smell came into your nostrils the first of the land breeze at last but by this time it was no more than a sort of mockery while a minute after you might catch a low sullen moaning sound far off through the emptiness from the strong surf the atlantic sends in upon the west coast before a squall if ever landsmen found out what land on the wrong side is the passengers of the serengapatam did that moment the shudder of the top sails aloft seemed to pass into every one's shoulders and a few quietly walked below as if they were safer in their cabins i saw violet hyde look round and round with a startled expression and from one place to another till her eye lighted on me and i fancied for a moment it was like putting some question to me i couldn't bear it twas the first time i felt powerless to offer anything though the thought ran through me again till i almost felt myself buffeting against the breakers with her in my arms i looked to the land where the smoke we had seen three-quarters of an hour ago rose again with a puff of air a slight flicker of flame in it as it wreathed off the low ground toward the higher point when all at once i gave a start for something in the shape of the hole struck me as if i'd seen it before next moment i was thinking of old bob martin's particular landmarks at the river mouth he spoke of and the notion of its possibly being hereabouts glanced on me like a godsend in the unsure dusky sight i had of it certainly it wore somewhat of that look and it lay fair to leeward of the weather while as for the dead shut appearance of it old bob had specially said you'd never think it was a river but then again it was more like a desperate fancy owing to our hard case and to run the ship straight for it would be the trick of a bedlamite at any rate a quick cry from aft turned me round and i saw a blue flare of lightning streak out betwixt the bank of grey haze and the cloud that hung over it then another and the clouds were beginning to rise slowly in the midst leaving a white glare between as if you could see through it towards what was coming the men could pull no longer 
but ahead of the ship there was now only about eight or ten fathoms of water with a soft bottom. The boats were hoisted in, and the men had begun to clue up and hand the top sails, which were lowered on the caps, when, just in the midst of the hubbub and confusion, as I stood listening to every order the mate gave, the steward came up hastily from below to tell him that the captain had woke up, and, being much better, wanted to see him immediately. Mr. Finch looked surprised, but he turned at once and hurried down the hatchway. The sight which all of us who weren't busy gazed upon, over the larboard bulwarks, was terrible to see. It was half dark, though the sun dropping behind the haze bank made it glimmer and redden. The dark heap of clouds had first lengthened out blacker and blacker, and was rising slowly in the sky like a mighty arch till you saw their white edges below, and a ghastly white space behind, out of which the mist and scud began to fly. Next minute a long sigh came into her jib and foresail, then the black bow of the cloud partly sank again, and a blaze of lightning came out all around her showing you every face on deck the inside of the round house aft the indian judge standing in it his hand to his eyes the land far away to the very swell rolling on to it then the thunder broke overhead in the gloom in one fearful sudden crack that you seemed to hear through every corner of cabins and forecastle below and the wet black fins of twenty sharks or so that had risen out of the inky surface vanished as suddenly. The India man had sheared almost broadside onto the clouds. Her jib was still up, and I knew the next time the clouds rose we should fairly have it. Flash after flash came, and clap after clap of thunder, such as you heard before a tornado. Yet the chief officer wasn't to be seen, and the others seemed uncertain what to do first, while everyone began to wonder and pass along questions where he could be. In fact, he had disappeared. For my part, I thought it very strange he stayed so long, but there wasn't a moment to lose. I jumped down off the poop stairs, walked forward on the quarter deck, and said coolly to the men nearest me, Run and haul down that jib yonder set the spanker here aft you'll have her taking slap on her beam quick my lads the men did so at once mcloyd was calling out anxiously for mr finch stand by the anchors there i sang out to let go the starboard one the moment she swings head to wind the scotch mate turned his head but ricketts face by the next flash showed he saw the good of it and there was no leisure for arguing, especially as I spoke in a way to be heard. I walked to the wheel and got hold of Jacobs to take the weather helm. We were all standing ready at the pitch of expecting it. Westwood, too, having appeared again by this time beside me, I whispered to him to run forward and look after the anchors when someone came hastily up the after hatchway with a glazed hat and pilot coat on, stepped straight to the binnacle, looked in behind me, then at the black bank of cloud, then aloft. Of course I supposed it was the mate again, but didn't trouble myself to glance at him further. When, hold on with the anchors, he sang out in a loud voice, hold on there for your lives. Heavens, it was the captain himself. At this, of course, I stood aside at once, and he shouted again, Hoist the jib and fore topmast stay sail. Stand by to set fore course. By Jove, this was the way to pay the ship head off, instead of stern off, from the blast when it came, and to let her drive before it at no trifle of a rate, whatever that might take her. Down with that spanker, Mr. McLeod, D'ye hear? roared Captain Williamson again, and, certainly, I did wonder what he meant to do with the ship, but his manner was so decided, and t'was so natural for the captain to strain a point to come on deck in the circumstances, 
that I saw he must have some trick of seamanship above me, or some special knowledge of the coast, and I waited in a state of the greatest excitement for the first stroke of the tornado. He waved the second and third mates forward to their posts. The India man, shearing and backing, like a frightened horse, to the long slight swell and the faint flow of the land air. The black arch to windward began to rise again, showing a terrible white stare reaching deep in, and a blue dart of lightning actually ran zigzag before our glaring fore-to-gallant mast. Suddenly the captain had looked at me, and we faced each other by the gleam, and, quiet, easy-going man as he was commonly, it just flashed across me there was something extraordinarily wild and raised in his pale visage, strange as the air about us made everyone appear. He gave a stride towards me, shouting, Who are? When a thunderclap took the words out of his tongue, and the next moment the tornado burst upon us, fierce as the wind from a cannon's mouth. For one minute the Serengapitum heeled over to her starboard streak, almost broadside on, and her spars towards the land. All on her beam was a long ragged white gush of light and mist pouring out under the black brow of the clouds, with a trampling, eddying roar up into the sky. The swell plunged over her weather side like the first break of a dam, and as we scrambled up to the bulwarks to hold on for bare life, we saw a roller fit to swamp us, coming on out of the sheet of foam, when crash went mizzen top mast and main two gallant mast. The ship swayed swiftly off by help of her head sails, and, with a leap like a harpooned whale, off she drove fair before the tremendous sweep of the blast the least yaw in her course, and she'd have never risen unless every stick went out of her. I laid my shoulders to the wheel with Jacobs, and Captain Williamson screamed through his trumpet into the men's ears, and waved his hands to ride down the foresheets as far as they'd go, which kept her right before it, though the sail could be but half set, and she rather flew than ran. The sea one breath of white foam back to the gushes of the mist, not having power to rise higher yet. Had the foresail been stretched, twould have blown off like a cloud. I looked at the captain. He was standing in the lee of the roundhouse, straight upright, though now and then peering eagerly forward, his lips firm, one hand on a belaying pin, the other in his breast nothing but determination in his manner, yet once or twice he started, and glanced fiercely to the after hatchway near, as if something from below might chance to thwart him. I can't express my contrary feelings, betwixt a sort of hope and sheer horror. We were driving right towards the land, at thirteen or fourteen knots to the hour. Yet could there actually be some harborage here away? or that river the quartermaster of the iris had mentioned and captain williamson know of it something struck me as wonderfully strange in the whole matter and puzzling to desperation still i trusted to the captain's experience the coast was scarce to be seen ahead of us lying black against an uneven streak of glimmer as she rushed like fury before the deafening howl of the wind and right away before our lee beam I could see the light blowing, as it were, across beyond the headland I had noticed, where the smoke in the bush seemed to be still curling, half smothered, along the flat in the lee of the hills, as if in a green wood, or sheltered as yet from seaweed, though once or twice a quick flicker burst up in it. All at once the gust of the tornado was seen to pour on it like a long blast from some huge bellows, and up it flashed. The yellow flame blazed into the smoke, spread away behind the point, and the ruddy brown smoke blew, whitening over it. When, almighty power, what did I see as it lengthened in, 
but part after part of old Bob's landmarks creep out ink black before the flare and the streak of sky together. First the low line of ground, then the notch in the block, the two rocks like steps, and the sugar loaf shape of the headland, to the very mop headed knot of trees on its rise. No doubt Captain Williamson was steering for it, but it was far too much on our starboard bow, and in a half an hour at this rate we should drive right into the surf you saw running along to the coast ahead. So I signed to Jacobs, for God's sakes, to edge her off as nicely as was possible. Captain Williamson caught my motion. Port, port, sirrah, he sang out sternly. Back with the helm, do you hear? And pulling out a pistol, he leveled it at me with one hand, while he held a second in the other. Land, land, shouted he, and from the lee of the roundhouse it came more like a shriek than a shout. I'll be there, though a thousand mutineers. His eye was like a wild beast's. That moment the truth glanced across me. This was the green leaf, no doubt, the scotch mate talked so mysteriously of. The man was mad. The land fever was upon him, as I'd seen it before in men long off the African coast. And he stood eyeing me with one foot hard stamped before him. "'Twas no use to be heard, and the desperation of the moment gave me a thought of the sole thing to do. I took off my hat in the light of the binnacle, bowed, and looked him straight in the face with a smile. When his eye wavered, he slowly lowered his pistol, then laughed, waving his hand toward the land to leeward, as if, but for the gale, you'd have heard him cheer.' At the instant I sprang behind him with a slack of a rope, and grappled his arms fast, though he'd got the furious power of a madman, and during half a minute twas wrestle for life with me. But the line was round him, arm and leg, and I made it fast, throwing him heavily on the deck just as one of the mates with some of the crew were struggling aft. By help of the belaying pins, against the hurricane, having caught a glimpse of the thing by the binnacle light. They looked from me to the captain. The ugly top man made a sign, as much as to say, knock the fellow down. But the whole lot hung back before the couple of pistol barrels I handled. The scotch mate seemed awfully puzzled, and others of the men, who knew from Jacobs what I was, came shoving along, evidently aware what a case we were in. A word to Jacob served to keep him steering her anxiously, so as to head two or three points more southeast in the end, furiously as the wheel jolted. So there we stood, the tornado sweeping sharp as a knife from astern over the poop deck, with a force that threw anyone back if he let go his hold to get near me and going up like a thunder aloft in the sky. Now and then a weaker flare of lightning glittered across the scud, and, black as it was overhead, the horizon to windward was but one jagged white glare, gushing full of broad shifting streaks through the drift of foam and the spray that strove to rise. Our forecourse still held, and I took the helm from Jacob's, that he might go and manage to get a pull taken on the starboard brace, which would not only slant the sail more to the blast, but give her the better chance to make the sole point of salvation by helping her steerage when most needed. Jacobs and Westwood together got this done, and all the time I was keeping my eyes fixed anxiously, as man can fancy, on the last gleams of the fire ashore, as her head made a fairer line with it. But, by little and little, it went quite out, and all was black, though I had taken its bearing by the compass, and I kept her to that for bare life, trembling at every shiver in the foresail's edge, lest either it or the mast should go. Suddenly we began to get into a fearful swell, the India man plunged and shook in every spar left her. 
I could see nothing ahead, from the wheel, and in the dark we were getting close in with the land, and the time was coming, but still I held southeast by east to the mark of her head, in the compass box, as nearly as might and main could do it, for the heaves that made me think once or twice she was to strike next moment, if she went ashore in my hands. Why, it was like to drive one mad with fear, and I waited for Jacobs to come back, with a brain ready to turn, almost as if I'd left the wheel to the other helmsman, and run forward into the bows to look out. The captain lay raving and shouting behind me, though no one else could either have heard or seen him, and where the chief officer was all this time surprised me, unless the madman had made away with him, or locked him in his own cabin, in return for being shut up himself, which in fact proved to be the case, cunning as it was to send for him so quietly. At length Jacob struggled aft to me again, and charging him, for heaven's sakes, to steer exactly the course I gave, I drove before the full strength of the squall along decks to the bowsprit, where I held on and peered out. Dead ahead of us was the high line of coast in the dark, not a mile of swell between the ship and it. But this time the low boom of the surf came under the wind, and you saw the breakers lifting all along, not a single opening in them. I had lost sight of my landmarks, and my heart gulped into my mouth. What I felt would be vain to say, till I thought I did make out one short patch of sheer black in the range of foam, scarce so far on our bow as I reckoned the fire to have been. Indeed, instead of that, it was rather on her weather than her lee bow, and the more I watched it, and the nearer we drove in that five minutes, the broader it was. But all that's good, thought I. If a river there is, there must be a mouth of it. But, by heavens, on our present course the ship would run just right upon the point, and, to strike the clear water, her foreyard would require to be braced up, able or not, though the force of the tornado would come fearfully on her quarter then. There was a chance of taking all the mass out of her, but let them stand ten minutes, and the thing was done. When we opened into the lee of the points, otherwise all was over. I sprang to the fore braces and besought the men near me, for God's sake, to drag upon the lee one, and that if their life hung upon it, when Westward caught me by the arm, I merely shouted through my hands into his ear to go aft to Jacob's and tell him to keep her head a single point up, whatever might happen, to the last. Then I pulled with the men at the brace till it was fast and scrambled up again to the bowsprit heel. Jove! How she surged to it! The little canvas we had strained like to burst. The mast trembled, and the spars aloft bent like whip shafts, everything below groaning again, while the swell and the blast together made you dizzy, as you watched the, the white eddies rising and boiling out of the dark, her cut water shearing through it and the foam as if you were going under it. The sound of the hurricane and the surf seemed to be growing together into one awful roar. My very brain began to turn with the pitch I was wrought up to, and it appeared next moment we should heave far up into the savage hubbub of breakers. I was wearying for the crash and the wild confusion that would follow, when all of a sudden, still catching the fierce rush of the gale athwart her quarter into the forecourse, which steadied her though she shuddered to it, all of a sudden the dark mass of the land seemed as if it were parting ahead of her, and a gleam of pale sky opened below the dusk into my very face. I no more knew what I was doing, by this time nor where we were, than the spar before me, till again the light broadened, glimmering blow betwixt the high lamp and a lump of rising level on the other bow. 
I hurried aft past the confused knots of men holding on to the lee of the bulwarks, and seized the spoke of the wheel. Tom, shouted I to Westwood, run and let free the spanker on the poop. Down with the helm, down with it, Jacobs, my lad, I sang out. Never mind spars or canvas. Down went the helm. The spanker held to luft her to the strength of the gust, and away she went up to port, the heavy swells rolling her in, while the rush into her staysails and forecourse came in one terrible flash of roaring wind. Tearing first one and then the other clear out of the bolt ropes, though the loose spanker abaft was in less danger, and the way she had from both was enough to take her careening round the point into its lee. By heavens, there were the streaks of soft haze low over the rising moon, under the broken clouds, beyond a fair line of dim, fringy woods, she herself just tipping the hollow behind, big and red, when right down from over the clouds above us came a spout of rain, then a sheet of it lifting to the blast as it howled across the point. Stand by to let go the larboard anchor, I sang through the trumpet, and Jacobs put the helm fully down at that moment, till she was coming head to wind, when I made forward to the mates and men. Let go, I shouted, not a look turned against me, and away thundered the cable through the hawse hole. She shook to it, sheared astern, and brought up with her anchor fast. By that time the rain was splashing down in a perfect deluge. You couldn't see a yard from you. All was one white pour of it, although it soon began to drive again over the headland, as the tornado gathered new food out of it. Another anchor was let go, cable paid out, and the ship soon began to swing the other way to the tide pitching all the while on the short swell. The gale still whistled through her spars for two or three hours, during which it began by degrees to lull. About eleven o'clock it was clear moonlight to leeward, the air fresh and cool. A delicious watch it was, too. I was walking the poop by myself, two or three men lounging sleepily about the forecastle, and Rickett below on the quarter-deck when I saw the chief officer himself rush up from below, staring wildly around him as if he thought we were in some dream or other. I fancied at first the mate would have struck Rickett from the way he went on, but I kept aft where I was. The eddies ran past the Indian man's side, and you heard the fast ebb of the tide rushing and rippling sweetly on her taunt cables ahead plashing about the bows and bends. We were in old Bob Martin's river, wherever that might be. End of Story 6 Biographical Notes Couples, George, born in Berwickshire, Scotland, 1822, died 1901, son of a Scottish clergyman. He had a strong desire to go to sea, at sixteen he was apprenticed as a sailor and made a voyage to india and back after studying art and divinity on his return he devoted himself to literature and besides the green hand he wrote the two frigates and some other books and contributed largely to magazines Story 7, Part 1 of Sea Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Sea Stories, edited by Cyrus Townsend Brady. Story 7, Part 1. My First Voyage from Two Years Before the Mast, by R. H. Dana, Jr. The fourteenth day of August was the day, fixed upon for the sailing of the brig Pilgrim, 
on her voyage from Boston, round Cape Horn, to the western coast of North America. As she was to get under way early in the afternoon, I made my appearance on board at twelve o'clock, in full sea rig, and with my chest, containing an outfit for a two or three years voyage, which I had undertaken from a determination to cure, if possible, by an entire change of life, and by a long absence from books and study, a weakness of the eyes which had obliged me to give up my pursuits, and which no medical aid seemed likely to cure. The change from the tight dress coat, silk cap, and kid gloves of an undergraduate at Cambridge, to the loose duck trousers, checked shirt, and tarpaulin hat of a sailor, though somewhat of a transformation, was soon made, and I supposed that I should pass very well for a jack tar. But it is impossible to deceive the practiced eye in these matters, and while I supposed myself to be looking as salt as Neptune himself, I was no doubt known for a landsman by every one on board as soon as I hove in sight. A sailor has a peculiar cut to his clothes, and a way of wearing them which a green hand can never get. The trousers, tight round the hips, and thence hanging long and loose round the feet, a superabundance of checked shirt, a low-crowned, well-varnished black hat, worn on the back of the head, with half a fathom of black ribbon hanging over the left eye, and a peculiar tie to the black silk neckerchief, with sundry other minutia, are signs the want of which betrayed the beginner at once. Besides the points in my dress which were out of the way, doubtless my complexion and hands were enough to distinguish me from the regular salt, who, with a sunburnt cheek, wide step, and rolling gait, swings his broad and toughened hands athwart ships, half open, as though just ready to grasp a rope. With all my imperfections on my head, I joined the crew, and we hauled out into the stream, and came to anchor for the night. The next day we were employed in preparations for sea, reeving studding sail gear, crossing royal yards, putting on chafing gear, and taking on board our powder. On the following night I stood my first watch. I remained awake nearly all the first part of the night, from fear that I might not hear when I was called, and when I went on deck, so great were my ideas of the importance of my trust, that I walked regularly fore and aft the whole length of the vessel, looking out over the bows and taffrail at each turn, and was not a little surprised at the coolness of the old salt whom I called to take my place, in stowing himself snugly away under the longboat for a nap. That was a sufficient lookout, he thought, for a fine night at anchor in a safe harbor. The next morning was Saturday, and a breeze having sprung up from the southward, we took a pilot on board, hove up our anchor, and began beating down the bay. I took leave of those of my friends who came to see me off, and had barely opportunity to take a last look at the city and well-known objects, as no time is allowed on board ship for sentiment. As we drew down into the lower harbor, we found the wind ahead in the bay, and we were obliged to come to anchor in the roads. We remained there through the day and a part of the night. My watch began at eleven o'clock at night, and I received orders to call the captain if the wind came out from the westward. About midnight the wind became fair, and having called the captain, I was ordered to call all hands. How I accomplished this I do not know, but I am quite sure that I did not give the true hoarse boatswain call of all hands up anchor ahoy in a short time every one was in motion the sails loosed the yards braced and we began to heave up the anchor which was our last hold upon yankee land i could take but little part in these preparations my little knowledge of a vessel was all at fault unintelligible orders were so rapidly given and so immediately executed there was such a hurrying about, and such an intermingling of strange cries and strange actions, that I was completely bewildered. There is not so helpless and pitiable an object in the world as a landsman beginning a sailor's life. At length those peculiar long-drawn sounds, which denote that the crew are heaving at the windlass, began, 
and in a few moments we were under way. The noise of the water thrown from the bows began to be heard. The vessel leaned over from the damp night breeze, and rolled with a heavy ground swell, and we had actually begun our long, long journey. This was literally bidding good night to my native land. The first day we passed at sea was the Sabbath. As we were just from port, and there was a great deal to be done on board, we were kept at work all day, and at night the watches were set, and everything put into sea order. When we were called aft to be divided into watches, I had a good specimen of the manner of a sea captain. After the division had been made, he gave a short characteristic speech, walking the quarter-deck with a cigar in his mouth, and dropping the words out between the puffs. Now, my men, we have begun a long voyage. If we get along well together, we shall have a comfortable time. If we don't, we shall have hell afloat. All you've got to do is obey your orders and do your duty like men. Then you'll fare well enough. If you don't, you'll fare hard enough, I can tell you. If we pull together, you'll find me a clever fellow. If we don't, you'll find me a bloody rascal. That's all I've got to say. Go below the larboard watch. I, being in the starboard, or second mate's watch, had the opportunity of keeping the first watch at sea. S., a young man, making like myself his first voyage, was in the same watch, and as he was the son of a professional man, and had been in a counting-room in Boston, we found that we had many friends and topics in common. We talked these matters over, Boston, what our friends were probably doing, our voyage, etc., until he went to take his turn at the lookout, and left me to myself. I now had a fine time for reflection. I felt, for the first time, the perfect silence of the sea. The officer was walking the quarter-deck, where I had no right to go. One or two men were talking on the forecastle, whom I had little inclination to join, so that I was left open to the full impression of everything about me. However much I was affected by the beauty of the sea, the bright stars, and the clouds driven swiftly over them, I could not but remember that I was separating myself from all the social and intellectual enjoyments of life. Yet, strange as it may seem, I did then and afterward take pleasure in these reflections, hoping by them to prevent my becoming insensible to the value of what I was leaving. But all my dreams were soon put to flight by an order from the officer to trim the yards, as the wind was getting ahead and I could plainly see by the looks the sailors occasionally cast to the windward, and by the dark clouds that were fast coming up, that we had bad weather to prepare for, and had heard the captain say that he expected to be in the Gulf Stream by twelve o'clock. In a few minutes eight bells were struck, the watch called, and we went below. I now began to feel the first discomforts of a sailor's life. The steerage in which I lived was filled with coils of rigging, spare sails, old junk, and ship stores which had not been stowed away. Moreover, there had been no berths built for us to sleep in, and we were not allowed to drive nails to hang our clothes upon. The sea, too, had risen, and the vessel was rolling heavily, and everything was pitched about in grand confusion. There was a complete hurrah's nest, as the sailors say, everything on top and nothing at hand. A large hawser had been coiled away upon my chest. My hats, boots, mattress, and blankets had all fetched away and gone over leeward, and were all jammed and broken under the boxes and coils of rigging. To crown all, we were allowed no light to find anything with, and I was just beginning to feel strong symptoms of seasickness and that listlessness and inactivity which accompany it. Giving up all attempt to collect my things together, I lay down upon the sails, expecting every moment to hear the cry of all hands ahoy, which the approaching storm would soon make necessary. I shortly heard the raindrops falling on deck, thick and fast, and the watch evidently had their hands full of work, for I could hear the loud and repeated orders of the mate, the trampling of feet, the creaking of blocks, 
and all the accompaniments of a coming storm. In a few minutes the slide of the hatch was thrown back, which let down the noise and tumult of the deck still louder. The loud cry of, All hands ahoy! Tumble up here and take in sail! saluted our ears, and the hatch was quickly shut again. When I got upon deck, a new scene and a new experience was before me. The little brig was close-hauled upon the wind, and lying over, as it then seemed to me, nearly upon her beam ends. The heavy head sea was beating against her bows, with the noise and force almost of a sledge-hammer, and flying over the deck, drenching us completely through. The topsail halyards had been let go, and the great sails were filling out and backing against the masts with a noise like thunder. The wind was whistling through the rigging, loose ropes flying about, loud and, to me, unintelligible orders constantly given and rapidly executed, and the sailors singing out at the ropes in their hoarse and peculiar strains. In addition to all this, I had not got my sea-legs on, was dreadfully sick, with hardly strength enough to hold on to anything, and it was pitch dark. This was my state when I was ordered aloft for the first time to reef topsails. How I got along I cannot now remember. I laid out on the yards and held on with all my strength. I could not have been of much service, for I remember having been sick several times before I left the topsail yard. Soon all was snug aloft, and we were again allowed to go below. This I did not consider much of a favor, for the confusion of everything below, and the inexpressible sickening smell, caused by the shaking up of the bilge water in the hold, made the steerage but an indifferent refuge from the cold wet decks. I had often read of the nautical experiences of others, but I felt as though there could be none worse than mine, for in addition to every other evil, I could not but remember that this was only the first night of a two years' voyage. When we were on deck we were not much better off, for we were continually ordered about by the officer, who said that it was good for us to be in motion. Yet anything was better than the horrible state of things below. I remember very well going to the hatchway and putting my head down when I was oppressed by nausea, and always being relieved immediately. It was as good as an emetic. This state of things continued for two days. Wednesday, August 20th. We had the watch on deck from four till eight this morning. When we came on deck at four o'clock, we found things much changed for the better. The sea and wind had gone down, and the stars were out bright. I experienced a corresponding change in my feelings, yet continued extremely weak from my sickness. I stood in the waist on the weather side, watching the gradual breaking of the day, and the first streaks of the early light. Much has been said of the sunrise at sea, but it will not compare with the sunrise on shore. It wants the accompaniments of the songs of birds, the awakening hum of men, and the glancing of the first beams upon trees, hills, spires, and housetops, to give it life and spirit. But though the actual rise of the sun at sea is not so beautiful, yet nothing will compare with the early breaking of day upon the wide ocean. There is something in the first gray streaks stretching along the eastern horizon, and throwing an indistinct light upon the face of the deep, which combines with the boundlessness and unknown depth of the sea round you, and gives one a feeling of loneliness, of dread, and of melancholy foreboding, which nothing else in nature can give. This gradually passes away, as the light grows brighter, and when the sun comes up, the ordinary monotonous sea day begins. From such reflections as these, I was aroused by the order from the officer, Forward there, rig the head pump. I found that no time was allowed for daydreaming, but that we must turn to at the first light. Having called up the idlers, namely carpenter, cook, steward, etc., and rigged the pump, we commenced washing down the decks. This operation, which is performed every morning at sea, 
takes nearly two hours, and I had hardly strength enough to get through it. After we had finished, swabbed down and coiled up the rigging, I sat down on the spars, waiting for seven bells, which was the sign for breakfast. The officer, seeing my lazy posture, ordered me to slush the mainmast from the royal masthead down. The vessel was then rolling a little, so that I felt tempted to tell him that I had rather wait till after breakfast, but I knew that I must take the bull by the horns, and that if I showed any sign of want of spirit or of backwardness that I should be ruined at once. So I took my bucket of grease and climbed up to the royal masthead. Here the rocking of the vessel, which increases the higher you go from the foot of the mast, which is the fulcrum of the lever, and the smell of the grease, which offended my fastidious senses, upset my stomach again, and I was not a little rejoiced when I got upon the comparative terra firma of the deck. In a few minutes seven bells were struck, the log hove, the watch called, and we went to breakfast. Here I cannot but remember the advice of the cook, a simple-hearted African. Now, said he, my lad, you are well cleaned out. You haven't got a drop of your longshore swash aboard of you. You must begin on a new tack, pitch all your sweetmeats overboard, and turn to upon good hearty salt beef and sea bread, and I'll promise you you'll have your ribs well sheathed, and be as hearty as any of em before you are up to the horn. This would be good advice to give passengers when they speak of the little niceties which they have laid in in case of seasickness. I cannot describe the change which half a pound of cold salt beef and a biscuit or two produced in me. I was a new being. We had a watch below until noon, so that I had some time to myself, and getting a huge piece of strong cold salt beef from the cook, I kept gnawing upon it until twelve o'clock. When we went on deck I felt somewhat like a man, and could begin to learn my sea duty with considerable spirit. At about two o'clock we heard the loud cry of, Sail ho! from aloft, and soon saw two sails to windward, going directly athwart our hawse. This was the first time that I had seen a sail at sea. I thought then, and have always since, that it exceeds every other sight in interest and beauty. They passed to leeward of us, and out of hailing distance, but the captain could read the names on their sterns with the glass. They were the ship Helen Marr of New York, and the brig Mermaid of Boston. They were both steering westward, and were bound in for our dear native land. Thursday, August 21st. This day the sun rose clear, we had a fine wind, and everything was bright and cheerful. I had now got my sea legs on, and was beginning to enter upon the regular duties of a sea life. About six bells, that is three o'clock p.m., we saw a sail on our larboard bow. I was very anxious, like every new sailor, to speak her. She came down to us, backed her main topsail, and the two vessels stood head on, bowing and curvetting at each other like a couple of war-horses reined in by their riders. It was the first vessel that I had seen near, and I was surprised to find how much she rolled and pitched in so quiet a sea. She plunged her head into the sea, and then, her stern settling gradually down, her huge bows rose up, showing the bright copper, and her stern and breast-hooks dripping like old Neptune's locks with the brine. Her decks were filled with passengers, who had come up at the cry of Sail Ho, and who, by their dress and features, appeared to be Swiss and French emigrants. She hailed us in French, but receiving no answer she tried us in English. She was the ship La Carolina from Havre for New York. We desired her to report the brig Pilgrim from Boston for the northwest coast of America five days out. She then filled away and left us to plough on through our waste of waters. This day ended pleasantly. We had got into regular and comfortable weather, and into that routine of sea life which is only broken by a storm, a sail, or the sight of land. As we had now a long spell of fine weather without any incident to break the monotony of our lives, 
there can be no better place to describe the duties, regulations, and customs of an American merchantman, of which ours was a fair specimen. The captain, in the first place, is Lord Paramount. He stands no watch, comes and goes when he pleases, and is accountable to no one, and must be obeyed in everything, without a question, even from his chief officer. He has the power to turn his officers off duty, and even to break them and make them do duty as sailors in the forecastle. Where there are no passengers and no supercargo, as in our vessel, he has no companion but his own dignity, and no pleasures, unless he differs from most of his kind, but the consciousness of possessing supreme power, and occasionally the exercise of it. The Prime Minister, the official organ, and the active and superintending officer is the chief mate. He is first lieutenant, boatswain, sailing master, and quartermaster. The captain tells him what he wishes to have done, and leaves to him the care of overseeing, of allotting the work, and also the responsibility of its being well done. The mate, as he is always called, par excellence, also keeps the log-book, for which he is responsible to the owners and insurers, and has the charge of the stowage, safe-keeping, and delivery of the cargo. He is also, ex officio, the wit of the crew, for the captain does not condescend to joke with the men, and the second mate no one cares for, so that when the mate thinks fit to entertain the people with a coarse joke or a little practical wit, every one feels bound to laugh. The second mate's is proverbially a dog's berth. He is neither officer nor man. The men do not respect him as an officer, and he is obliged to go aloft, to reef and furl the topsails, and to put his hands into the tar and slush with the rest. The crew call him the sailor's waiter, as he has to furnish them with spun yarn, marlin, and all the other stuffs that they need in their work, and has charge of the boatswain's locker, which includes serving boards, marlin spikes, etc., he is expected to maintain his dignity and to enforce obedience, and still is kept at a great distance from the mate and obliged to work with the crew. He is one to whom little is given and of whom much is required. His wages are usually double those of a common sailor, and he eats and sleeps in the cabin, but he is obliged to be on deck nearly all his time and eats at the second table that is, makes a meal out of what the captain and chief mate leave. The steward is the captain's servant, and has charge of the pantry, from which every one, even the mate himself, is excluded. These distinctions usually find him an enemy in the mate, who does not like to have any one on board who is not entirely under his control. The crew do not consider him as one of their number, so he is left to the mercy of the captain. The cook is the patron of the crew, and those who are in his favor can get their wet mittens and stockings dried, or light their pipes at the galley in the night watch. These two worthies, together with the carpenter and sailmaker, if there be one, stand no watch, but being employed all day are allowed to sleep in at night, unless all hands are called. The crew are divided into two divisions, as equally as may be, called the watches. Of these the chief mate commands the larboard, and the second mate the starboard. They divide the time between them, being on and off duty, or, as it is called, on deck and below, every other four hours. If, for instance, the chief mate with the larboard watch have the first night watch from eight to twelve, at the end of the four hours the starboard watch is called, and the second mate takes the deck, while the larboard watch and the first mate go below until four in the morning, when they come on deck again and remain until eight, having what is called the morning watch, as they will have been on deck eight hours out of the twelve, while those who had the middle watch from twelve to four will only have been up four hours, they have what is called a forenoon watch below, that is from eight a.m. till twelve a.m., in a man-of-war, and in some merchantmen, this alternation of watches is kept up throughout the twenty-four hours. 
but our ship, like most merchantmen, had all hands from twelve o'clock to dark, except in bad weather when we had watch and watch. An explanation of the dog watches may perhaps be of use to one who has never been at sea. They are to shift the watches each night, so that the same watch need not be on deck at the same hours. In order to effect this, the watch from four to eight a.m. is divided into two half or dog watches, one from four to six, and the other from six to eight. By this means they divide the twenty-four hours into seven watches instead of six, and thus shift the hours every night. As the dog watches come during twilight, after the day's work is done, and before the night watch is set, they are the watches in which everybody is on deck. The captain is up, walking on the weather side of the quarter-deck, the chief mate on the lee side, and the second mate about the weather gangway. The steward has finished his work in the cabin, and has come up to smoke his pipe with the cook in the galley. The crew are sitting on the windlass, or lying on the forecastle, smoking, singing, or telling long yarns. At eight o'clock, eight bells are struck, the log is hove, the watch set, the wheel relieved, the galley shut up, and the other watch goes below. The morning commences with the watch on deck turning to at daybreak, and washing down, scrubbing, and swabbing the decks. This, together with filling the scuttled butt with fresh water, and coiling up the rigging, usually occupies the time until seven bells, half after seven, when all hands get breakfast. At eight the day's work begins, and lasts until sundown, with the exception of an hour for dinner. Before I end my explanations, it may be well to define a day's work, and to correct a mistake prevalent among landsmen about a sailor's life. Nothing is more common than to hear people say, Are not sailors very idle at sea? What can they find to do? This is a very natural mistake, and being very frequently made, it is one which every sailor feels interested in having corrected. In the first place, then, the discipline of the ship requires every man to be at work upon something when he is on deck, except at night and on Sundays. Except at these times, you will never see a man on board a well-ordered vessel standing idle on deck, sitting down or leaning over the side. It is the officer's duty to keep every one at work, even if there is nothing to be done but to scrape the rust from the cabin cables. In no state prison are the convicts more regularly set to work, and more closely watched. No conversation is allowed among the crew at their duty, and though they frequently do talk when aloft or when near one another, yet they always stop when an officer is nigh. With regard to the work upon which the men are put, it is a matter which probably would not be understood by one who has not been at sea. When I first left port, and found that we were kept regularly employed for a week or two, I supposed that we were getting the vessel into sea trim, and that it would soon be over, and we should have nothing to do but to sail the ship. But I found that it continued so for two years, and at the end of the two years there was as much to be done as ever. As has often been said, a ship is like a lady's watch, always out of repair. When first leaving port, studding sail gear is to be rove, all the running rigging to be examined, that which is unfit for use to be got down, and new rigging rove in its place. Then the standing rigging is to be overhauled, replaced, and repaired, in a thousand different ways. And wherever any of the numberless ropes or the yards are chafing or wearing upon it, their chafing gear, as it is called, must be put on. This chafing gear consists of worming, parceling, roundings, battens, and service of all kinds, both rope yarns, spun yarn, marlin, and seizing stuffs. Taking off, putting on, and mending the chafing gear alone upon a vessel would find constant employment for two or three men during working hours for a whole voyage. The next point to be considered is that all the small stuffs which are used on board a ship 
such as spun yarn, marlin, seizing stuff, etc., are made on board. The owners of a vessel buy up incredible quantities of old junk, which the sailors unlay after drawing out the yarns, knot them together, and roll them up in balls. These rope yarns are constantly used for various purposes, but the greater part is manufactured into spun yarn. For this purpose, every vessel is furnished with a spun yarn winch, which is very simple, consisting of a wheel and spindle. This may be heard constantly going on deck in pleasant weather, and we had employment during a great part of the time for three hands in drawing and knotting yarns and making spun yarn. End of Story 7, Part 1「Story Seven, Part Two of Sea Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Sea Stories, edited by Cyrus Townsend Brady. Story Seven, Part Two. My First Voyage from two years before the mast by r h dana jr another method of employing the crew is setting up rigging whenever any of the standing rigging becomes slack which is continually happening the seizing and coverings must be taken off tackles got up and after the rigging is bowsed well taut the seizings and coverings replaced which is a very nice piece of work there is also such a connection between different parts of a vessel that one rope can seldom be touched without altering another you cannot stay a mast aft by the back stays without slacking up the head stays etc if we add to this all the tarring greasing oiling varnishing painting scraping and scrubbing which is required in the course of a long voyage and also remember this is all to be done in addition to watching at night steering reefing furling bracing making and setting sail and pulling hauling and climbing in every direction one will hardly ask what can a sailor find to do at sea if after all this labor after exposing their lives and limbs in storms wet and cold wherein the cub drawn bear would couch the lion and the belly-pinched wolf keep their furs dry the merchants and captains think that they have not earned their twelve dollars a month out of which they clothe themselves and their salt beef and hard bread they keep them picking oakum ad infinitum this is the usual resource upon a rainy day for then it will not do to work upon rigging and when it is pouring down in floods instead of letting the sailors stand about in sheltered places and talk and keep themselves comfortable they are separated to different parts of the ship and kept at work picking oakum i have seen oakum stuff placed about in different parts of the ship so that the sailors might not be idle in the snatches between the frequent squalls upon crossing the equator some officers have been so driven to find work for the crew in a ship ready for sea that they have set them to pounding the anchors often done and scraping the chain cables the philadelphia catechism is six days shalt thou labor and do all thou art able and on the seventh holy stone the decks and scrape the cable this kind of work of course is not kept up off cape horn cape of good hope and in extreme north and south latitudes but i have seen the decks washed down and scrubbed when the water would have frozen if it had been fresh and all hands kept at work upon the rigging when we had on our pea jackets and our hands so numb that we could hardly hold our marlin spikes i have here gone out of my narrative course in order that any who read this may form as correct an idea of a sailor's life and duties as possible i have done it in this place because for some time our life was nothing but the unvarying repetition of these duties which can be better described together 
Before leaving this description, however, I would state, in order to show landsmen how little they know of the nature of a ship, that a ship carpenter is kept in constant employ during good weather on board vessels which are in what is called perfect sea order. After speaking the Carolina on the 21st August, nothing occurred to break the monotony of our life until Friday, September 5th, when we saw a sail on our weather starboard beam. She proved to be a brig under English colors, and passing under our stern, reported herself as forty-nine days from Buenos Aires, bound to Liverpool. Before she had passed us, sail ho was cried again, and we made another sail, far on our weather bow, and steering athwart our hawes. She passed out of hail, but we made her out to be a hermaphrodite brig, with Brazilian colors in her main rigging. By her course she must have been bound from Brazil to the south of Europe probably Portugal. Sunday, September 7th. Fell in with the northeast trade winds. This morning we caught our first dolphin, which I was very eager to see. I was disappointed in the colors of this fish when dying. They were certainly very beautiful, but not equal to what has been said of them. They are too indistinct. To do the fish justice, there is nothing more beautiful than the dolphin, when swimming a few feet below the surface on a bright day. It is the most elegantly formed, and also the quickest fish in salt water, and the rays of the sun striking upon it, in its rapid and changing motions, reflected from the water, make it look like a stray beam from a rainbow. This day was spent like all pleasant Sabbaths at sea. The decks are washed down, the rigging coiled up, and everything put in order, and throughout the day only one watch is kept on deck at a time. The men are all dressed in their best white duck trousers and red or checked shirts, and have nothing to do but make the necessary changes in the sails. They employ themselves in reading, talking, smoking, and mending their clothes. If the weather is pleasant, they bring their work and their books upon deck, and sit down upon the forecastle and windlass. This is the only day on which these privileges are allowed them. When Monday comes, they put their tarry trousers on again and prepare for six days of labor. To enhance the value of the Sabbath to the crew, they are allowed on that day a pudding, or, as it is called, a duff. This is nothing more than flour boiled with water and eaten with molasses. It is very heavy, dark, and clammy, yet it is looked upon as a luxury, and really forms an agreeable variety with salt beef and pork. Many a rascally captain has made friends of his crew by allowing them duff twice a week on the passage home. On board some vessels this is made a day of instruction and religious exercises, but we had a crew of swearers from the captain to the smallest boy, and a day of rest, and of something like quiet social enjoyment, was all that we could expect. We continued running large before the northeast trade winds for several days, until Monday, September 22nd, when, upon coming on deck at seven bells in the morning, we found the other watch aloft, throwing water upon the sails, and looking astern we saw a small clipper-built brig with a black hull heading directly after us. We went to work immediately, and put all the canvas upon the brig which we could get upon her, rigging out oars for studding sail yards, and continued wetting down the sails by buckets of water whipped up to the masthead, until about nine o'clock, when there came on a drizzling rain. The vessel continued in pursuit, changing her course as we changed ours, to keep before the wind. The captain, who watched her with his glass, said that she was armed and full of men, and showed no colors. We continued running dead before the wind, knowing that we sailed better so, and that clippers are the fastest on the wind. We also had another advantage. The wind was light, and we spread more canvas than she did, having royals and sky sails fore and aft, and ten studding sails, while she, being a hermaphrodite brig, had only a gaff topsail aft. Early in the morning she was overhauling us a little, 
but after the rain came on and the wind grew lighter we began to leave her astern all hands remained on deck throughout the day and we got our arms in order but we were too few to have done anything with her if she had proved to be what we feared fortunately there was no moon and the night which followed was exceeding dark so that by putting out all the lights on board and altering her course four points we hoped to get out of her reach we had no light in the binnacle but steered by the stars and kept perfect silence through the night at daybreak there was no sign of anything in the horizon and we kept the vessel off to her course wednesday october first crossed the equator in longitude twenty four degrees twenty four minutes west i now for the first time felt at liberty according to the old usage to call myself a son of neptune and was very glad to be able to claim the title without the disagreeable initiation which so many have to go through after once crossing the line you can never be subjected to the process but are considered as a son of neptune with full powers to play tricks upon others this ancient custom is now seldom allowed unless there are passengers on board in which case there is always a good deal of sport it had been obvious to all hands for some time that the second mate whose name was foster was an idle careless fellow and not much of a sailor and that the captain was exceedingly dissatisfied with him the power of the captain in these cases was well known and we all anticipated a difficulty foster called mister by virtue of his office was but half a sailor having always been short voyages and remained at home a long time between them his father was a man of some property and intended to have given his son a liberal education but he being idle and worthless was sent off to sea and succeeded no better there for unlike many scamps he had none of the qualities of a sailor he was not of the stuff that they make sailors of he was one of the class of officers who are disliked by their captain and despised by the crew he used to hold long yarns with the crew and talk about the captain and play with the boys and relax discipline in every way this kind of conduct always makes the captain suspicious and is never pleasant in the end to the men they prefer to have an officer active vigilant and distant as may be with kindness among other bad practices he frequently slept on his watch and having been discovered asleep by the captain he was told that he would be turned off duty if he did it again to prevent it in every way possible the hen coops were ordered to be knocked up for the captain never sat down on deck himself and never permitted an officer to do so the second night after crossing the equator we had the watch from eight till twelve and it was my helm for the last two hours there had been light squalls through the night and the captain told mr foster who commanded our watch to keep a bright lookout soon after i came to the helm i found that he was quite drowsy and at last he stretched himself on the companion and went fast asleep soon afterward the captain came very quietly on deck and stood by me for some time looking at the compass the officer at length became aware of the captain's presence but pretending not to know it began humming and whistling to himself to show that he was not asleep and went forward without looking behind him and ordered the main royal to be loosed on turning round to come aft he pretended surprise at seeing the master on deck this would not do the captain was too wide awake for him and beginning upon him at once gave him a grand blow-up in true nautical style you're a lazy good-for-nothing rascal you're neither boy man soldier nor sailor you're no more than a thing aboard a vessel you don't earn your salt you're worse than a mahon soldier and other still more choice extracts from the sailor's vocabulary after the poor fellow had taken this harangue he was sent into his stateroom and the captain stood the rest of the watch himself at seven bells in the morning all hands were called aft and told that foster was no longer an officer on board and that we might choose one of our number for second mate 
it is usual for the captain to make this offer and it is very good policy for the crew think themselves the choosers and are flattered by it but have to obey nevertheless our crew as is usual refused to take the responsibility of choosing a man of whom we would never be able to complain and left it to the captain he picked out an active and intelligent young sailor born near the kennebec who had been several canton voyages and proclaimed him in the following manner i choose jim hall he's your second mate all you've got to do is to obey him as you would me and remember that he is mr hall foster went forward into the forecastle as a common sailor and lost the handle to his name while young foremast jim became mr hall and took up his quarters in the land of knives and forks and teacups sunday october fifth it was our morning watch when soon after day began to break a man on the forecastle called out land ho i had never heard the cry before and did not know what it meant and few would suspect what the words were when hearing the strange sound for the first time but i soon found by the direction of all eyes that there was land stretching along on our weather beam we immediately took in the studding sails and hauled our wind running for the land this was done to determine our longitude for by the captain's chronometer we were in twenty-five degrees west but by his observations we were much further and he had been for some time in doubt whether it was his chronometer or his sextant which was out of order this landfall settled the matter and the former instrument was condemned and becoming still worse was never afterwards used as we ran in toward the coast we found that we were directly off the port of pernambuco and could see with the telescope the roofs of the houses and one large church and the town of olinda we ran along by the mouth of the harbor and saw a full-rigged brig going in at two p m we again kept off before the wind leaving the land on our quarter and at sundown it was out of sight it was here that i first saw one of those singular things called catamarans they are composed of logs lashed together upon the water have one large sail are quite fast and strange as it may seem are trusted as good sea boats we saw several with from one to three men in each boldly putting out to sea after it had become almost dark the indians go out in them after fish and as the weather is regular in certain seasons they have no fear after taking a new departure from olinda we kept off on our way to cape horn we met with nothing remarkable until we were in the latitude of the river la plata here there are violent gales from the southwest called pamperos which are very destructive to the shipping in the river and are felt for many leagues at sea they are usually preceded by lightning the captain told the mates to keep a bright lookout and if they saw lightning at the southwest to take in sail at once we got the first touch of one during my watch on deck i was walking in the lee gangway and thought that i saw lightning on the bow i told the second mate who came over and looked out for some time it was very black in the southwest and in about ten minutes we saw a distinct flash the wind which had been southeast had now left us and it was dead calm we sprang aloft immediately and furled the royals and topgallant sails and took in the flying jib hauled up the mainsail and trysail squared the after yards and awaited the attack a huge mist capped with black cloud came driving towards us extending over that quarter of the horizon and covering the stars which shone brightly in the other part of the heavens it came upon us at once with a blast and a shower of hail and rain which almost took our breath from us the hardiest was obliged to turn his back we let the halyards run and fortunately were not taken aback the little vessel paid off from the wind and ran on for some time directly before it tearing through the water with everything flying having called all hands we close reefed the topsails and trysail 
furled the courses and jib, set the fore topmast staysail, and brought her up nearly to her course, with the weather braces hauled in a little to ease her. This was the first blow that I have seen which could really be called a gale. We had reefed our topsails in the Gulf Stream, and I thought it something serious, but an older sailor would have thought nothing of it. As I had now become used to the vessel and to my duty, I was of some service on a yard, and could knot my reef point as well as anybody. I obeyed the order to lay aloft with the rest. Footnote. This word lay, which is in such general use on board ship, being used in giving orders instead of go, as lay forward, lay aft, lay aloft, etc., I do not understand to be the neuter verb lie mispronounced, but to be the active verb lay with the objective case understood, as lay yourselves forward, lay yourselves aft, etc. End footnote. And found the reefing a very exciting scene, for one watch reefed the fore topsail and the other the main and every one did his utmost to get his topsail hoisted first. We had a great advantage over the larboard watch, because the chief mate never goes aloft, while our new second mate used to jump into the rigging as soon as we began to haul out the reef tackle, and have the weather earing passed before there was a man upon the yard. In this way we were almost always able to raise the cry of haul out to leeward before them, and having knotted our points, would slide down the shrouds and backstays, and sing out at the topsail halyards to let it be known that we were ahead of them. Reefing is the most exciting part of a sailor's duty. All hands are engaged upon it, and after the halyards are let go there is no time to be lost, no soldiering or hanging back then. If one is not quick enough, another runs over him. The first on the yard goes to the weather earing, the second to the lee, the next two to the dog's ears, while the others lay along the bunt, just giving each other elbow room. In reefing, the yard arms, the extremes of the yards, are the posts of honor, but in furling, the strongest and most experienced stand in the slings, or middle of the yard, to make up the bunt. If the second mate is a smart fellow, he will never let anyone take either of these posts from him, for if he is wanting either in seamanship, strength, or activity, some better man will get the bunt and earrings from him, which immediately brings him into disrepute. We remained for the rest of the night, and throughout the next day, under the same close sail, for it continued to blow very fresh, and though we had no more hail, yet there was a soaking rain, and it was quite cold and uncomfortable, the more so because we were not prepared for cold weather, but had on our thin clothes. We were glad to get a watch below, and put on our thick clothing, boots and sou'westers. Toward sundown the gale moderated a little, and it began to clear off in the southwest. We shook our reefs out one by one, and before midnight had top-gallant sails upon her. We had now made up our minds for Cape Horn and cold weather, and entered upon every necessary preparation. Tuesday, November 4th. At daybreak saw land upon our larboard quarter. There were two islands of different size, but of the same shape. Rather high, beginning low at the water's edge, and running with a curved ascent to the middle. They were so far off as to be of a deep blue color, and in a few hours we sunk them in the northeast. These were the Falkland Islands. We had run between them and the mainland of Patagonia, at sunset the second mate, who was at the masthead, said that he saw land on the starboard bow. This must have been the island of Staten Land, and we were now in the region of Cape Horn, with a fine breeze from the northward, topmast and topgallant studding sails set, and every prospect of a speedy and pleasant passage round. End of Story 7, Part 2 Biographical Notes Dana, R. H., American author and lawyer. Born 1815, died 1882. Graduated at Harvard, 1837. 
afterwards shipped as common sailor, and made a voyage to California. He described the voyage in two years before the mast, became a distinguished maritime lawyer, and wrote The Seaman's Friend to Cuba and Back, and edited an edition of Wheaton's International Law.